So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the tutorial on bias issues and solutions in recommender systems. Uh, so uh, a little bit about the procedure for today. So we're going to um, have a stream tutorial. Our um, tutorial presenters are here. Uh, uh, I'm going to be here on live camera. And we're going to have two ways of asking questions. So the people who are here in the, um, in, in the room can go up to the mic and ask questions. Uh, and so that's team physical and, and team virtual can ask questions in the live Q&A that they'll find next to their stream. So I'll be monitoring that stream from the chair chair, which is over there. And uh, I will be uh, making sure that your questions get uh, get asked. So that means that uh, because of this, there might be a little bit of interruption. If there's, if I see a pressing question coming through on the live stream, I'm going to uh, interrupt and, and, and ask that question on behalf of the person that's asking it on the stream. Okay. Um, and so we are really happy today to, to welcome uh, Jiwei Chen and Zhang Wang and Fu Feng and Zhang Yang He um, from the University of Science and Technology uh, for their tutorial on bias issues and solutions in recommender systems. So without further ado, I give the floor um, to, to Ji Wai Chen. Uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Yes, yeah. sounds good. Uh, for the introductions, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the tutorial of basic issues and the solutions in recommended systems. Today, it's our honor to give this important topic. We are going to introduce the global pictures of these areas and discuss some open problems. Uh, we hope our tutorial could help you to better understand this area. Uh, also, we hope we could uh, inspire your more ideas on this topic. Uh, I'm Jia Wei Chen from University of Science and Technology of China. Also, we have other three presenters, uh, Xiang Wang and Tu Li from the National University of Singapore, and one professor, uh, Xiang Nan, from uh, my university. Uh, first of all, uh, let's see the background of the recommend systems. Uh, I believe most of you are quite familiar with the recommend systems. Uh, recommend systems can address uh, information overload problem. Uh, it could provide uh, personalized uh, suggestions uh, to each user and tell him uh, what items you may like. Uh, literally, uh, recommend systems can free users' effort to find items and has been widely applied in many information systems. Uh, for example, uh, the Amazon, Facebook, and the YouTube, uh, the recommend systems play a very important role uh, in, this, uh, in these information systems. Uh, while recent years uh, have witnessed uh, many uh, research papers on recommend systems, uh, most of these papers focus on uh, inviting uh, new machine learning based models to better fit users' behavior data. Uh, more specifically, uh, provided we have a uh, recommend systems with a set of user view and a set of items I. Uh, also, we, we will collect users' history feedback on items, uh, which can be represented as a matrix R. Uh, the objective of our recommend systems is to learn a recommendation model, uh, which can be formula formulated as a function F. Uh, we will use F to give our predictions for each user's preference on, on each item. And we hope these predictions can be uh, consistent with user's true preference. Uh, to achieve this goal, uh, this method will formulate the problem as a machine learning task and uh, directly minimize the difference uh, between the predict predicted score and the observed feedback. Uh, our community has witnessed various effective, effective recommended methods uh, in, in the early years. 
uh, research has focused on matrix factorizations and the matrix factorization machine based on the collaborative filtering equation. Uh, they assume the real uh, use of the preference matrix is row rank, and they will factorize the observed data into the uh, product of users' latent vectors and the item latent vectors. Later, uh, with the development of the deep neural network, uh, our community also uh, proposed to leverage the powerful neural network to infer user preference. The TED model is a, a neural collaborative filtering. Uh, they will leverage neural network to map a user's latent vectors and item latent vectors to generate the final predictions of user preference. Uh, more recently, uh, graph models also provide an even more powerful and uh, explained uh, this branch of method uh, integrate various information like uh, like uh, user item uh, uh, like user item uh, history interactions or the knowledge graph if recommendation. Uh, however, also this method is a bit power and the power a more power more and a more powerful fitting ability. Uh, their performance may suffer in real world recommend systems. This the reason is that the working flow of the real world recommend systems usually forms a feedback loop and the feedback data. And in other words, the training data is often full of biases. Uh, as we can see, the ecosystems of the F existing recommend systems, the working flow of recommend systems can be summarized as a loop consists of three stages. On the training stage, the recommendation models are trained or updated based on the collected user item interaction data. Uh, then on the serving stage, the recommendation systems will infer user preference over the items and uh, returns the recommendation results to users. For example, we usually rank the predicted pre preference score and give the top key items for recommendation. Uh, we know that the recommended systems will increase the exposure probability of these items. Uh, this state, of course, will affect the user's future uh, behaviors and uh, their decisions on, select, on selecting items. Uh, then on the collecting stage, user's new actions are collected and uh, will be merged into the training data set to further update the model. Uh, in this way, the model can capture the more precise and fresh preference of users. Uh, however, uh, we can find uh, we can find each will form uh, a loop. Uh, the users and the recommend systems are in a process of mutual dynamic evolution, uh, where user generates interactions and the and the interactions will be affected by the recommendation systems. And the recommendation model will get updated by uh, leveraging uh, this new data. Of course, uh, these processes will form a feedback loop. The, out the output of a recommend system will affect its input. Uh, this these processes not only will incur biases, but also will intensify the biases along the loop. Uh, so where biases is from, uh, on the one hand, in the data collection stage, the data is collected from observed user behavior. And uh, as discussed before, we know that user behavior will be affected by, by the systems and by other many factors. For example, uh, we know that a user uh, generates behavior uh, on the basis of the exposed items. In other words, uh, before users uh, interacted with these items, he must know these items. It means that uh, the observed feedback will be affected by the exposure mechanism of the systems. The, the items that have been recommended by the system by the systems are more likely to be interacted by the users, uh, even if the items is not selected by the users. Also, uh, also users' judgment will be affected by the uh, public opinions. We usually follow uh, the public opinions to select the items. 
also we uh, our judgment will be affected by the uh, display positions. Uh, these all factors will make our feedback is inconsistent with our true preference. Uh, all in all, uh, these biases will make the collector data deviate from reflecting user true preference uh, directly training a model on such biased data, of course, will result in poor performance. Uh, besides, uh, the biases will hurt model accuracy, but the data uh, may further incur serious biases issue in the recommendation results. Uh, in a typical uh, recommended recommend systems, users or items are usually not evenly presented in the data. For example, uh, in a typical recommend systems, some items are more popular than others, and they will receive more uh, user behaviors. Uh, when training a model on such unbalanced data, the models will focus on uh, learning these overrepresented users and uh, reinforcement and reinforcing their performance. Uh, even if doing so will hurt the performance of other items or users, uh, it will potentially uh, discriminate others and hurt others' performance. Of course, it is unfair. Uh, also. Uh, we know that always recommending uh, popular items is not a good thing. Always recommending popular items will, will hurt users' productivity and uh, their experiments on the systems. Uh, it will cause the loss of the users. Uh, what's more serious, uh, the feedback loop not only uh, created biases, but also will intensify biases over time. Note that the exposure mechanisms of the recommend systems uh, will affect user behaviors. Uh, the biases such as uh, uh, popularity biases in the, in the recommendations results will further increase the exposure opportunity of these items, uh, making uh, these popular items even more popular. Uh, and uh, this feedback will uh, circle back into the training data, and uh, the model will, uh, will, uh, will increasingly intensify these biases and uh, this and uh, these processes will, will proceed again and again and uh, amplify the popularity biases again and again along this loop uh, and we are raising the so-called Matthew effect and it will damage the uh, ecosystem of the recommend systems so uh, biases is becoming a serious problem in recommendation systems uh, blindly feeding the data without considering the inherent biases, uh, of course, will result in many serious issues. Uh, from the uh, economic perspective, biases will affect the recommendation accuracy and will hurt users' experiments and causing the losses of users and the losses of item providers. Uh, besides the uh, economic effect, biases will also incur society issues uh, biases will reinforce discrimina discriminations of certain user groups. Also, uh, biases would decrease the diversity of users. Uh, users' personalized uh, tests have been squeezed. Uh, in a word, uh, biases is evil in recommend systems. We must address this problem. Uh, recent years uh, has seen a surge of research effort on recommendation biases. Uh, the left uh, figure shows the number of related papers in top venues, uh, such as the uh, uh, recommend systems, triple W, Sugaya, and Wisdom. We can find the number of the publications increased heavily since uh, uh, since uh, 2015. Uh, also, the recommend system conference, uh, one of the popular venues on this topic. Uh, also, the communities think highly of the topic of recommendation biases. Uh, besides the publication numbers, the CIGA even uh, presents the best paper award to the paper on the popularity biases and unfairness uh, in 2021. Uh, while Western also award the best papers to online and uh, contractual debating. Uh, biases not only draw increased attention from the uh, acad academic, uh, from the research, but also from the industry. For example, 
uh, one task of KDB Cup 2020 organized by Alibaba uh, is to handle the long tail buses in recommended systems. So uh, given the importance of the recommendation debate and the uh, many publications of this area, I would believe it is the right time to give a tutorial to help the researchers and the engineers to better understand the current progress and the future work on this topic. Uh, in this tutorial, we will detail six types of biases uh, in recommendations and reveal recent advances in recommendation debasing. We also would like to identify some open problems and discuss some future di directions. Uh, the tutorial is, is organized as a follow. Uh, it consists of two parts. The first part, we will introduce biases in data along with their definition and the categories and the solutions. Also, we will discuss uh, how the feedback loop intensifies biases and reveal recent advances on addressing this problem. Uh, in the second part, uh, we then detail uh, two famous biases in solving stage, the popularity biases and the unfairness. Uh, we will discuss their characteristics and the solutions. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, shared the slides at uh, this GitHub. Uh, now, let's go deep into the first part. Uh, in these sections, uh, we will introduce something about uh, databases in recommendation. We will answer the following four important questions. I think these questions are also the things that you may concern. Uh, first, we will answer uh, what is databases we will give its definitions. Uh, also, we will ask what causes databases. We will give the, uh, the taxonomy of biases uh, in terms of their causes. Uh, we then discuss how to address this problem uh, and introduce some recent type solutions uh, to address uh, databases. Finally, we will discuss something about the uh, biases amplifications along the loop. Uh, so. Uh, what is databases? In fact, the databases can be understood as a, a specific data distribution drift. Uh, this concept is similar to the out of distribution, the OOD problem. The chain data distribution uh, is different from the test data distributions. Uh, such uh, deviation is called the biases. Uh, it may original from uh, many factors, but its inherent nature uh, is, is to make the collected data uh, is different from the test data distributions. Uh, it will, the, uh, the, uh, the basis will make the data deviated from a reflecting user to preference and the recommended model, which is trained on such best data. Uh, of course, will result in uh, suboptimal results. Uh, to better understand this effect, uh, as we can see from this figure, uh, the red curve uh, denotes the two risk functions, the ideal objective function to evaluate the quality of the model, uh, while the blue, uh, while the blue curve uh, denotes the expectation of the best uh, empirical risk. So, empir the empirical risk. Uh, can denote the loss functions that the model uh, utilizes to, uh, to training uh, the models based on the training data set. Uh, as the two uh, risks are expected uh, over two different distributions, uh, they will behave rather different uh, even in their optimal point. As we can see, the optimal point uh, for the red curve is F star, and the optimal point for the empirical risk is FT. Uh, they are quite different. Uh, it means that even if we have a large data set, uh, when the model could arrive at the empirical optimal point FT, uh, there exists a certain gap uh, between the real, uh, real optimal F star and the uh, empirical optimal FT. Uh, it means that uh, the model uh, will optimize a skewed loss functions and the resulting uh, and the resulting uh, suboptimal results. 
uh, given the negative impact of databases, so uh, why does the train data distributions is different from the ideal test distributions? Uh, what, which factors uh, affect the distributions? Uh, in the follow, we will answer these questions and uh, classify the databases into four types. Uh, that is, we classify the uh, bases into the second bases, exposure bases, conformity bases, and the position bases. Uh, they have different, uh, they happen in different data, different types of data, and uh, have different causes and effects. Uh, in the following, we will detail and introduce their characteristics. Uh, first, uh, to better understand these bases, we would like to uh, factorize the, uh, the data distributions into two parts. Uh, as we can see, uh, the PUIR can be uh, factorized into the uh, PUI, which means the observed user item distributions, and uh, the PTRUI, it, it denotes the uh, label distributions for, uh, for the user, for the uh, use for the user item pair UI. Uh, as such, the bases, uh, uh, the different bases would deviate the observed pair distributions or the label distributions. Uh, the first type of data bases uh, is selection bases. Uh, selection bases happens as users are free to choose which items to reach. Uh, so that the observed ratings are not a uh, uh, or representative samples of all ratings. Uh, in other words, the rating data is often missing not at random. The observed user item distributions uh, is different from the ideal uniform uh, uniform distributions, uh, and the and the observed user item distributions it depends on the rating values. Uh, as we can see, this toy example, uh, the ratings with Higher uh, with the higher values are more likely to be observed, and uh, the and the uh, and the user item pairs with low ratings are more are more likely to miss. Uh, so uh, when we directly uh, training our model uh, on such biased data, uh, the we will easily overestimate the user preference on these items. Uh, typically, uh, for example. Uh, uh, if if the second users predict uh, to if we make a predict for the uh, second users and the third items, uh, we will easily to give uh, high ratings because the average rating values for the third for the third items is four. Uh, but we know, as we can see, this is not the case. Uh, in fact, the users very dislike this uh, this these items because. Uh, be, uh, he will give this, give the items, give these items a uh, reaching reaching two. Uh, but uh, but these two, uh, but these two scores is missed. Uh, so uh, it means that uh, the the missing mechanism should be considered uh, when we address selection biases. Uh, directly training a model without considering the latent biases. Uh, would give a terrible prediction. Uh, also, uh, recent work have validated the existence of the selection biases uh, in recommended systems. Uh, for example, Martin has uh, have, uh, Martin and, uh, and his groups have conducted a survey uh, to collect user ratings on randomly selected items and uh, the user selected items. The user selected items is collected from the common uh, common uh, recommend systems. Uh, they found the quite uh, different rating distributions of these two data sets. Uh, comparing with the random selected items, uh, the, the data collected from user uh, history behavior uh, is biased and is different from the ground truth. Uh, users will tend to reach, uh, tend to select and rate the items uh, that they like. Also, users are more likely to reach uh, extremely bad or good items. Uh, the second type of biases uh, is exposure biases. Uh, it happens in implicit feedback data. 
uh, as users are only exposed to a part of specific items. Uh, it means that uh, not all interactions are observed, and the observed user item distributions uh, PTUI is different from the uh, p from the uh, ideal PDUI. Uh, and the PTUI usually uh, depends on the processes of how the users exposed to the items. Uh, in some sense, exposure biases is similar to the selection biases as they both affect uh, PDUI, uh, but they have different causes and happens in different types of data. Uh, exposure biases will be more difficult to handle and uh, will incur more serious problems uh, as it happens in implicit feedback data will, uh, where all negative feedback is missing. Uh, as we can see from this example, uh, in the implicit feedback data, all negative feedback is missing. Uh, we cannot uh, direct, directly train the model on the observed data because we only have one. Uh, we lack negative signals. The model trained on on this positive on this positive data and will easily uh, sink sink into overfitting. Uh, but for the missing data, uh, due to the exposure biases, ambiguity arises in the explanation of um, of unobserved interactions. Uh, the missing data can be attributed to uh, to two possible reasons. The one is caused by the exposure biases. Uh, this missing data just just caused by uh, users does not know these items. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this Missing data can be caused by dislike. Uh, the users is is uh, is the users uh, the items does not match uh, user interest. So uh, the users this do not uh, click these items. Uh, what's more, uh, exposure biases is common in practical and may be original from manufacturers. Uh, we know that user exposure will be affected by the policy of the uh, previous recommend systems, and uh, the previous recommend systems will control what items to show to the users. Uh, besides uh, the exposure policy of the recommend systems, the, exposure, the user's exposure will be affected by his background and the item, pop and the item popularity. Uh, the third type of biases is conformity biases. Conformity biases happens as users tend to behave similar to the others in a group. Uh, we know that uh, in real world, we usually uh, behave similar to, uh, to our groups, uh, even if doing so uh, is not consistent with our judgment. Uh, let's see this toy example uh, when the third users uh, to give the ratings, uh, as we can see this 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 toy example, when the fourth uh, when the fourth user gives the ratings to the third uh, to the uh, uh, when the third user to give the ratings for the fourth uh, for the fourth items, uh, he, he uh, based on his his own judgment, uh, he would like to give the values three. Uh, but he found most of others like these items. Uh, he will uh, change his opinion and uh, and influenced by the public opinions, the user will finally change for low ratings and uh, he finally gives a, a rating score for. Uh, such familiar, such, such uh, situation is common and will screw the observed label distributions and will make our collected data may not reflect user true purpose. Uh, another basis is called position basis, uh, which happens as users tend to uh, interact with items in higher positions of the recommendation list. Uh, take the layout of group role store as an example. Uh, we can find different items, uh, usually have different positions, uh, and the positions uh, will affect user feedback. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the ranking position will affect the chance of the item uh, expo exposure to the users. Uh, we know that the higher ranking items are more likely to um, 
to be seen by us. Uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, users usually uh, trust the recommend systems. Uh, their judgment uh, will be affected by the position by the position of the items uh, in the ranking list. Uh, they will think. Uh, it, they will think the higher ranking items uh, suggest that the recommend systems believe uh, they may like it. So they will trust the recommend systems and click these top items, uh, even if it seems does not match uh, their, perf their preference. Uh, we then start positioning uh, where distribution drift as, as a position basis. Uh, with above descriptions, uh, we know that uh, these four types of biases always occur in recommendation data, uh, making the data does not reflect user true preference uh, if we blindly fit the data uh, without considering the inherent biases. Of course, the model will result in poor performance. So uh, we need to decide, develop some debiasing strategies uh, for our recommend systems, and the debiasing strategy is of importance uh, for our recommend systems. Uh, in this tutorial, we will uh, introduce and reveal uh, recent advances in recommendation debiasing. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we summarized uh, recent advances into three lines. Uh, the reweighting strategy, uh, each will give ways for each instance uh, to rescale their contributions on model training. Uh, the relabeling, each will give a, a new pseudo label for the missing or the best data. Uh, the first, the last one is generative modeling. Uh, each will assume the generation processes of the data, and then uh, they will uh, perform the best uh, based on this this generative model or the graphic model. Uh, the, so let's now go deep into the first strategy. Uh, we know that uh, the biases would school the data distributions. Uh, the basic idea of reweighting is to give uh, a proper weighting for each instance uh, so that the, the weighted distribution uh, is close to ideal test, test distribution. As we can see from this figure, uh, the biases will, uh, deviate, the, will deviate the test distribution. The IPS uh, will uh, pull back the uh, the best, the biased uh, data distributions to close to the uh, test data distribution. Uh, the reweighting strategy is mainly address the uh, uh, deviation of the uh, PUI, the observed user item distribution. Uh, as we can see uh, from this, as we can see from this formula, uh, uh, if we can properly define the weights. We can obtain the unbiased estimation of the ideal loss functions. Uh, as we can see, uh, the gap between the ideal loss functions with the empirical uh, risk is that uh, they are expected over different distribution. So uh, when we give a pro uh, when we give a weight for each instance to offset uh, this gap from the uh, from the distribution. Uh, for example, if we set the weights uh, as the uh, as the uh, uh, as the uh, PDUI divided by uh, PTUI, uh, we can find the uh, PTUI uh, will be offset, and the expected loss function will be equal to the ideal one. Uh, also, we know that uh, the ideal user item distribution is always set as uniform. Uh, so we just need to focus on the uh, PTUI. Uh, we usually set the weights, uh, set the weights as the uh, inverse of uh, specific parameters, and we and we name these uh, these parameters is propensity, uh, which capture the distribution PTUI. Uh, in fact, uh, it is consist consistent with our intuition. Uh, for example, uh, we know that. Uh, some items are more, some instances are more easily to be observed. It means that uh, this this instance uh, have a relatively large PTUI uh, because they are more easily to be observed. Uh, it means that this this instance is overrepresented. So we need to uh, downweight downweight this downweight the contribution of this 
of this of this instance uh, so that make make the uh, so that uh, in in the training this 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 data will make a uh, reasonable contributions uh, on the on the model learning. Uh, now let's see some examples uh, to see how IPS address uh, some biases. Uh, this is a toy example of how IPS addresses a selection biases. As we can see, the instance with low rating values are more likely to be missed. Uh, if we directly train a model on this bias data, uh, we will easily overestimate the user preference on the items. Uh, IPS will uh, reach the data contribution, give a larger weight for this instance uh, with lower ratings because uh, they are easily easily um, easily missed. Uh, so that the model can give a, a reasonable estimation. Another example uh, lies on address uh, position biases. We know that users are more likely to see the items uh, in high ranking. So uh, we need to offset this effect and downweight the contribution of the of the interpreted items in higher ranking. Uh, the higher rankings may cause by uh, may cause by the position biases. So we need to downweight their contribution. Uh, the higher ranking does not does not mean the users uh, is very like these items. Uh, overall, the IPS strategy is simple and uh, straightforward. Also, it is theoretic soundness. Uh, if we can give a uh, uh, proper ways we can achieve unbiased learning. Uh, however, uh, this method has some limitations. Uh, the first is that uh, if the PTUI is very small, uh, it, and, uh, uh, and the inverse of the propensity score will be very large, and it will cause the training unstable uh, and, making the and making the training high variance. Uh, the second limitation is uh, is that uh, it is difficult to set a proper propensity score. Uh, also, it is an open problem uh, for existing methods to address this, to address this problem. Uh, the, the third limitation is that it requires positivity. Uh, we will discuss it later. So now let's first discuss uh, how to set a proper propensity scores. Uh, there are two solutions to uh, to address this problem. The first solution is to interview, uh, interview the systems. For example, uh, for position biases, uh, we may can randomly uh, permulate the ranking list and then observe users' feedback on such random lists. Uh, this treatment can evaluate the effect of the position uh, as other factors have, have been isolated. Uh, similarly, uh, for selection biases, we may also collect the user's feedback uh, on some randomly selected items to evaluate the effect of selection biases. Uh, also, this strategy is straightforward and provide, uh, go, uh, provide standard uh, for evaluation. However, uh, intervening the systems would harm user status, would harm user status factor would uh, user experiments and uh, the company benefit. Uh, another strategy for propensity score uh, is to infer from the observed data. Uh, we can train a classifier uh, for position or user selections. Uh, typically, uh, for selection biases, we can, uh, we can train a classifier uh, to infer uh, how like the, how like to infer the likely that the user would uh, with the items in terms of their features. Uh, also, this strategy uh, does not need to intervene the systems. Uh, we know that it is just a, a approximated estimation of the propensity score. Uh, if we uh, fall to consider some important features, uh, the estimated score would be quite uh, deviated from the real values, uh, so the performance will suffer. Uh, now let's discuss the, uh, the another limitations of the rewriting. Uh, it requires the positivity condition. Uh, as we can see, just a leverage probability score is insufficient uh, to address uh, to address all biases. Uh, 
let S denotes the support region of the cancer distribution. But uh, due to the uh, due to the uh, basis, uh, in we may just we may just collect uh, collect a uh, part of uh, training data of the training data and the and the training data distribution just cover a part of the region of the support of the of the test data distributions. It means that uh, the training data just provide the information of the region S1 uh, and the region S0. Uh, the training data cannot provide uh, information for the uh, for the data distributions uh, on the on the uh, on the uh, on the region S0. Uh, it means that uh, the training data distribution PT can only provide the partial data knowledge. Uh, it can just provide uh, provide the information of the region S1, uh, and we do not how likely the S0 looks like. Uh, even if we use use IPS, uh, it cannot handle this situation. So uh, we must uh, we need to impute the pseudo label uh, to the region S to the region S0, uh, so that the model can uh, learn something about the region S0 and can make a reasonable prediction. Now let's see the second strategy, the relabel, the relabeling. Uh, this strategy will give a new pseudo label for the missing or the bias instance. Uh, the, base, the basic idea of relabeling is to change the data distribution by imputing uh, pseudo labels. Uh, relabeling can address both the uh, both the deviation of the of the distribution PUI and the distribution PRUI. Uh, as we can see, uh, for the label distribution deviation, it can correct correct the uh, correct the observed reaching values uh, from RUI uh, to the MUI. Uh, the MUI can be the uh, can be the ground truth of the uh, directly from the uh, PD, PDRUI. Uh, also, uh, for the pair distribution uh, deviation, it can impute values on the missing data. Uh, this treatment can revise the pair distribution towards the ideal ones or the uniform one. Uh, let's take an example to show the data imputation for the dressing selection basis. Uh, recall that the inherent nature of select of the selection biases. Yes, uh, we know that each is uh, missing not at random. Uh, to deal with this problem, a directory solution is to impute the missing data, uh, give the uh, pseudo labels for the blank part uh, with some specific values. Uh, if the imputed data is approximately correct, the selection biases can be adjusted. As we can see from this toy example, uh, we can impute the, uh, the score two uh, for the black entries, uh, give, give a prior knowledge and tell the model that the user is more likely to dislike this missing data. Uh, with the imputed data, uh, the model will not overestimate the uh, user preference on the missing items and will achieve better performance than those without. Uh, this strategy is simple and straightforward, uh, but the model performance is rather uh, sensitive, sensitive to the imputation values uh, because the model is also supervised by the impute, by the uh, by the studio labels. Uh, the wrong imputation values will even harm the model performance and will guide the model towards the uh, wrong objective. Uh, especially in recommend systems, we usually have a uh, large number of missing entries, the studio labels usually make too much contribution on learning and will uh, override the signals from the observed data. And also, uh, imputing uh, proper studio labels is, is more difficult uh, because there are a large number of missing entries. Uh, so we know that the relabeling and the rewriting has their own merits and limitations uh, relabeling is quite sensitive to the imputed values, uh, but it can handle uh, various types of biases. Uh, Reweighting can only address the uh, 
and adjust deviation of the uh, PUI, but uh, it is relatively robust to the weighting. So uh, does it possible to faster their merits and address their limitations? Okay, uh, I think an idea is to combine these two methods and enjoy their advantages. Uh, on the one hand, as discussed before, we may just uh, impute some important CPU data uh, for the blank region. And also, we can uh, reweight the uh, impute data to control their confidence uh, or the effective of this imputation data. Uh, if we think this impute, impute uh, if we think this uh, pseudo labels is not very reliable, uh, we can give a small, a small weight. Uh, if we think this impute values is very, uh, is very is reliable and can reflect user true preference, uh, we can give a, a higher weight. Uh, an, an example for reweighting plus relabeling is doubly robust method. Uh, this kind of method would design uh, the weighting strategy in a more smart way. Uh, each can enjoy uh, a doubly robust property. Uh, the model remains uh, robust, uh, remain unbiased if either the uh, imputation values or the probability scores are. Uh, uh, accurate. Uh, as we can see, each will give a uh, weight uh, for the observed data and will in impute uh, the studio labels on the missing entries. Uh, this method has a low variance and relatively robust to the uh, probability scores and the imputation values. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this method still requires the uh, proper assignment of the imputation uh, values or the probability scores. Of course, it is not easy. Uh, another type, another application of this method is to address exposure biases. Uh, we know that uh, in implicit feedback, uh, missing data can be entry, can be uh, can be uh, caused by the a user's unawareness or the user's dislike. Uh, a solution for exposure biases uh, is to uh, impute zeros to all the unobserved data and consider they are all negative, but uses a ways to control uh, to control their uh, contribution. Uh, the the ways is the W two. Uh, w two uh, reflects how likely the items. Uh, is exposed to the users and uh, control the contributions of this data. Uh, uh, of course, we know that W2 uh, is quite important uh, for addressing exposure biases and uh, would affect the model performance heavily. Uh, recent years have witnessed many uh, heuristic weighting strategies. Uh, for example, uh, weighting with item popularity is widely adopted. Uh, because we believe uh, popular items are more likely to be exposed to the users. The unobserved interactions are more likely caused by the fact uh, that the users dislike the items. Uh, also, there are some, uh, some other strategies for weightings. Uh, some researchers would utilize uh, user social network or user community to infer a user's exposure. And then use use and then to get the uh, W two uh, to weight the contribution of the of these negative items. Uh, this method uh, is is heuristic and uh, like flexibility and uh, is usually far from the best choice, uh, but they indeed achieve a relatively good performance. Uh, but they are uh, far from the best choice, I think. Uh, so how to uh, weight the negative weight uh, is still an open problem uh, for exposure biases. Uh, another example uh, for relabeling and reweighting is for position biases. Uh, we know that uh, position uh, will not only affect user's exposure, uh, but also will affect user's decisions. Uh, as discussed before, 
uh, IPS cannot handle these situations uh, due to uh, the deviation of the label distributions. Uh, so uh, we need to refine the uh, collected labels to address such position biases. Uh, the most popular model is uh, the fine model. Uh, the, this model is proposed by Martin. Uh, this method will first uh, minus uh, turn to offset the effect of the label deviations. And then uh, they will uh, reweight the instance to offset the exposure effect of the uh, position biases. Uh, they will use the reweighting and the relabeling strategy to address the two facts of the position back of the position basis. Now we would like to make a, a small summary. Uh, we know that relabeling and reweighting is a promising strategy uh, as it uh, inherits the uh, merits of the relabeling and reweighting. Uh, however, the effectiveness uh, of this method relies on a proper configures. Uh, in other words, the, the proper parameters of the weights and the new labels. Uh, existing methods for these parameters uh, usually rely on a human heuristic design according to the uh, data distributions and uh, the biases they aim at addressing. Uh, however, this heuristic strategy would suffer from two weaknesses. The first is uh, each is a lake, lake of universality. Uh, they just uh, the draft, uh, they, this method can just uh, draft, this method can, can only uh, address one specific basis, uh, one phase other basis or the situation uh, that containing multiple types of basis, uh, this basis would fall short. Uh, the second uh, limitation is that uh, this method is lack of adaptivity. Uh, they usually rely on human, uh, human knowledge. Uh, for, or in other words, the human expertise uh, that thoroughly understand the biases in the data and uh, understand how these biases affect the model learning. Uh, even worse, we know that the optimal parameters are usually involved with the time going by uh, because the systems uh, and the collected data distributions uh, is dynamic and uh, will evolve uh, every day. Uh, new users, uh, new items, and uh, new interactions uh, will change the uh, data distribution. Uh, it means that uh, when we use this method uh, on our uh, recommend systems, the engineering needed to manually turn the configures uh, day and night, which is a nightmare for them. So uh, is there uh, universal and adaptive solutions for addressing uh, various biases? Uh, the answer is yes, but uh, we know that there is no uh, free lunch. Uh, we need to utilize a small uh, unbiased data uh, to guide the inference of these parameters. Uh, also, the bias is a solution for this problem. Uh, they leverage the uniform data to validate the effectiveness of the selected uh, debiasing parameters. Uh, they will utilize a meta learning framework. Uh, this framework consists of a base learner and a meta learner. The base learner uh, can be any basic recommended system model, uh, which is trained on the current uh, debiasing parameters. Uh, they then uh, test the learned model on the uniform data, and the uniform data will give a, a feedback signal to update the developing parameters. Uh, in this way, the model uh, can adaptively learn the developing parameters uh, uh, without human manually design. Uh, however, we know that uh, the uniform data is often uh, in a small scale uh, directly optimize such uh, large scale developing parameters uh, would easily incur overfitting. So, uh, they would leverage a meta model to generate the debiasing parameters. Uh, they directly use a linear meta model. Uh, this treatment can uh, transform uh, learning uh, large scale debiasing parameters 
uh, into the uh, into just uh, the uh, learning a uh, small scale uh, linear parameters. Uh, another challenge is uh, learning would uh, involve the uh, uh, nested loop of optimizations. Uh, in each update of the balancing parameters, uh, we need to uh, entirely train the base learners. Uh, to address this problem, uh, they utilize a greedy strategy. They directly test the model performance uh, on the uniform data after one step update. Uh, of uh, they will make uh, uh, they will update the uh, the debugging debugging strategy. Uh, or in other words, they will update the uh, update the meta model. Uh, just after one step update of the uh, basic. Uh, recommendation models. Uh, rather than uh, fully training the uh, basic recommendation models, uh, as we can see, uh, they will make a tentative update of the of the recommendation model uh, based on current uh, debugging parameters. Uh, here, they will just uh, make a one step update instead of uh, directly uh, training the basic models entirely. Uh, then they will uh, test the learn the, the update of the uh, the recommendation model on uniform data and uh, and test the and test the uh, test the performance uh, on the unbiased data uh, and this and this this process will give a feedback uh, give a gradient to update the uh, debugging parameters. Then they will up, update the uh, update the uh, the recommendation models uh, actually, uh, based on the uh, update the uh, debugging parameters. Now let's see uh, the, the this method performance. Uh, as we can see, uh, the authors of AutoDebug uh, have has have tested AutoDebug on Yahoo and Code datasets. Uh, these data sets are explicit feedback data uh, with selection biases. Also, uh, these data sets contain a small set of uniform data. As we can see, uh, auto debugs, uh, auto performance, state of the art methods, uh, also auto debugs is better than auto debugs W1. Auto debugs W1 is uh, uh, is the special cases of the auto debugs uh, where they do not use, do not impute the pseudo labels on the missing data. Uh, this result validates the, uh, the importance of, of to, uh, importance of, of introducing uh, imputation values uh, to impute the pseudo labels on the missing data. Also, uh, we can find the auto debug W1 is better than IPS. It means that uh, learning debug debugging parameters from uniform data is better than the uh, heuristic uh, design. Uh, also, the authors uh, report the performance of auto debug uh, on, on implicit feedback data and the simulated data sets. Uh, the data sets. Uh, uh, will contain the selection biases and the position biases. Uh, as we can see, uh, the auto debug consistently uh, auto performance uh, state of the art. Uh, auto performance, this method uh, in both uh, addressing exposure biases and the biases uh, combinations. Uh, however, uh, also auto debug achieves good performance on addressing variance biases. It also has some limitations. The first is that uh, it requires uniform data, and uh, we know that uniform data is not easily to be collected, and uh, in many cases, uniform data is not available, and it would uh, limit the application of this method. Uh, also, the debugging processes of the auto debug is a black box. Uh, the method uh, is lack of explanations. Uh, also, auto debug does not utilize the uh, prior knowledge of human. In fact, some human prior knowledge, 
for example, the assumptions of the truth relations may also help address a uh, biases problem. So uh, to better utilize human knowledge and give, uh, give an expandable debiasing, uh, another type of debiasing strategy uh, is a generative model. Uh, this method will assume uh, the generative processes of data and then uh, they will uh, reduce the biases according to the uh, assumed processes. Um, so, uh, so, sorry, I'm going to can... interrupt for a, a moment before you go on to the generative modeling with some questions. Uh, so we have some questions coming in online and also going to take some questions from the room. Um, so, do I, sorry, I know you, I don't think you can see me, um, but um, I'm, I'm Martha Larson and I'm, um, I'm moderating a session for you um, because uh, you, you, you all couldn't be here in, 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 in person. So let's just take some questions now. Um, I'll start with some online questions and then um, people in the room, if you want to ask questions, please do that. Um, we, we're asking you to step to the mic because otherwise um, you, we can't hear your questions on the other side. Um, but uh, just there's, and I'm going to ask you the questions that people are, have been upvoting too. Um, so um, one person, I think one question was, could you just go over the definition of the propensity score again, uh, just to make sure that was clear for everybody? Um, and, and maybe mention okay. your notation for people who joined a bit late. Yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, Ooh, is there, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just go over the definition because there's a few people here, or I don't know how many, but for some people I see that that, that propensity score definition is new. So could you just um, tell, it, tell us um, about how it works? Uh, do you mean the, uh, the definition is new and is, uh, I, I, I got it, uh, because uh, in, some, in some recent work, uh, they will definition the probability score as the uh, uh, POUI, given UI. Uh, it means that the, prob the, the probability that the, uh, that, the, uh, that, the, that this instance uh, has been observed. Uh, in fact, this value is uh, is the same as this these definitions, uh, because uh, because uh, uh, if if the PTY is, is large, then this this then this instance is easily, easily to be observed. Okay. Uh, it means that the their value is is uh, is the same. Uh, if we if we just normalize the normalize the uh, the the PTUI. And, 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 P, and PTUR is the, is the uh, probability from the training data. That, is that correct? Yeah. The T it's, is? The, yeah. it's the probability of the, of the training data. And uh, it is means that the, uh, the probability that the, uh, that the, uh, that the user, that the us this user item pairs will be observed. Okay, and, and then in that in that formula, P D U I, the 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 numerator. So we have the pro uh, probability of the training ideal, data. And then ideal uh, ideal uh, distributions, uh, it usually uh, let it as a uniform distributions. Okay. Because we have to uh, estimate the uh, the models for each user item pair. Okay, okay, and then. Um, just looking at the, the online, and we have somebody in the room, I'll get to you in just one, one moment. Um, and then, okay, so then they're asking for that, for that ideal distribution, and, and maybe if you could answer that in general, concerning what you've, uh, what you've said so far, uh, how, how is it possible to estimate the ideal distribution? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Your, your, your voice is a bit, uh, is not very loudly. I, I cannot hear uh, clearly. Uh, uh, could you please uh, repeat your yeah, questions? I'm sorry. Yes, no, no problem. I'll, I'll repeat. And, and, and I'm also sorry. So 
Am I right? You you cannot see me at this moment. You don't see you don't see me. Yeah, I can see you. Oh, you do. Okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. So so it's it's a it's a really it's a really basic question, and and also I think that like a lot of what you're saying is directed at answering this question. But the question is when you when you need an ideal distribution, how do you in general estimate it? For example, for the for the IPS, H how do I, how in general do I esti estimate the the PDUI? Uh, I, I got it. Uh, in, uh, the PDUI is always is uh, ideal uh, distributions. We we always cannot know. Uh, yeah. But uh, in when we evaluate the models, we usually uh, you, we usually let the PDUI has a uniform distributions because uh, we think each users and each items is also important. So uh, when we so when we uh, evaluate the models, uh, we we usually let this this is as a one because each is a uniform distributions. So we just need to, need to focus on the PTUI. Okay, so when you say uniform distribution, can you, can you just clarify um, what what that means exactly? Is it a flat distribution of ratings, or what is what is the uniform distribution? Uh, it means that uh, it means that as we can see this example, uh, as we can see this example, uh, each is the uh, ideal uh, data. It is the ideal data that we can collect uh, all users' feedback on the all items. Uh, so uh, the uniform distributions can be considered that uh, when we evaluate the uh, recommendation performance, we will uh, we will you we will randomly choose a user item pair. Uh, this is a uniform distributions, uh, and it is the same as we evaluate. Uh, evaluate the recommendation performance or, the, or, or our prediction or the, or the model, model predictions for all user item pairs. And uh, all user item pairs make the equal contributions on evaluation. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Now, now just for the online people who are asking live questions on the Q&A. So this session is being recorded. Um, you can also write me a little note saying like, hey, can you ask that question again? Um, I didn't get the answer. So just like talk to me on the live chat. And also, if I don't ask your question, afterwards that will be transferred within the hub to the tutorial page and you'll be able to see the, the questions and maybe get answers on them and watch the recording. So we are recording now and you'll be able, so if I don't get to your live question, um, you 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 might be able to get it um, later, but um, if you didn't get an answer, then just write again in the chat, and then people are upvoting, and we'll go from there. Okay, I hope that's clear. So now we're coming to the question um, in the room, who's standing patiently at the microphone. Thank you for that. Yes, please, your question. Yeah. So um, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, really interesting. Um, so one in one of your slides, you also mentioned intervening with the system. Um, for example, devising could also be done by, um, I think, yeah, collecting random data. Uh, my question is, would that solve all of the biases? And with all of the biases, I mean the selection bias, exposure bias, or are some uh, biases uh, still in the data when you uh, collect random data? Uh, thank you. It is a very good question. Uh, I think if you can do fully randoms, I think uh, uh, it may address uh, all biases. Uh, for example, uh, for selection biases, uh, we can uh, randomly uh, we can uh, randomly select some items and uh, let users to give the ratings for these items. And uh, for the position biases, we can randomly uh, formulate the, the formulate the uh, positions. And for the uh, conformity biases, uh, we can let the, let the uh, users does not know the uh, public opinions. Uh, also, 
uh, for the uh, for the exposure biases, uh, I think it is the same as the selecting biases. We can uh, we can randomly select something uh, to to let users like it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I th I think if if we can make a good run, uh, make a perfect uh, randomly, uh, I think it it will make a. Uh, 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 estimations of of the recognitions without biases. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more question from uh, in the in the hall. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jave, for the great presentation so far. My question is also mainly on the reweighting or relabeling perspectives. Yeah, I'm asking whether uh, it's possible to do the reweighting process in a boosting way. For example, you can uh, evolve or just uh, change the uh, reweighting policy every few sec uh, few rounds, and then in this way, uh, you can make it up to date. And if that's actual or real, uh, how about the cost regarding this? And uh, uh, whether that means, in fact, if we do this, we don't have to do any relabeling. Uh, because I think maybe if we combine two things together, that also means we combine the noises together. Uh, yeah, thanks for your answer. Mm, yes, I think it's a uh, uh, good suggestion. Uh, maybe we can leave it as a future work. Uh, I think maybe it is a promising uh, solutions for, for the dressing classes. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Okay, that that concludes the um, the questions for for now. Um, so for for Jiawei, we have um, fifteen more minutes before the break. Um, perhaps you can go five minutes into the break to um, make up for the time we we took using asking the questions. But we do need to take a ba break in twenty minutes so people here can um, grab a cup of coffee. Um, on, on site and also give our our online uh, listeners a bit of a, a break so okay you were going you're going to tell us about generative modeling so let's uh, let, let's continue that's looking forward to that uh, thank you mm, let's go to the generative modeling uh, yeah here Uh, okay, uh, uh, the basic idea of the uh, generative modeling uh, is to, uh, is to uh, assume the generation processes of data uh, to decouple the effect of, two, of the user two preference and uh, from the effect of the biases. Uh, also, uh, they will train in the model, train in the graphic model uh, based on the observed data, and uh, then uh, during the inference stage, uh, they will isolate the effect of biases and uh, just leverage user true preference to make our predictions. Uh, the key of this kind of method uh, is, is the design of the generative processes. Uh, recent work is by different kinds of methods for different biases. Uh, here we give some examples. Uh, as we can see, uh, for the selected biases, existing methods will decouple the observed data into two tasks. Uh, they will jointly model in both a uh, rating uh, prediction task uh, to answer uh, which rich weight values the user gives, and uh, the missing data prediction task uh, to, pred to predict uh, which items the user selected to reach. Uh, in this way, a uh, user preference can not only learn from reaching values, but also from the missing mechani mechanisms. Uh, then in the inference stage, uh, they will make uh, predictions and uh, re recommendation and the recommendations just based on user true preference. Uh, also, this kind of method is expandable and sometimes effectiveness uh, in some scenario. Uh, jointly modeling the miss uh, missing mechanism and uh, reaching values will lead to uh, uh, complex models, uh, which is not easily to be trained. Uh, this is its limitations. Uh, also, um, for another example, is to address the exposure biases. Uh, they will assume the uh, generative processes of the data from the two steps. Uh, they will introduce uh, a variable, AUI, 
uh, denotes whether a user U has exposed to the item F. Uh, if the user knows, knows these items, uh, then we can utilize the uh, common recommendation models uh, to judge whether the users like these items. Then if the, if the users uh, does not know these items, of course, it cannot uh, interactive, interactive with, with the items. Uh, these models explicitly differentiate the causes uh, for the for the unobserved interactions. It may be caused by the uh, unexposure. It can be caused by the uh, user dislike. Uh, more interestingly, uh, the authors of of this work have discussed the connections between this model with the rewriting models. Uh, they found that when optimizing the graphic models, the model, the same thing as the rewritings, uh, the model would uh, adaptively give a weight for each instance, and the weight is indeed the posterior probability of the exposure. Uh, I think it is uh, very interesting. Also, this model uh, gives a way, uh, a fundamental way to learn the weight. Uh, also, uh, however, this method also has some uh, limitations. Uh, as as uh, graphic models, it is not easily to be trained. Also, uh, also it has a large a large number of parameters to be estimated because AUI uh, is 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 for each user item is is for each user item pairs. Uh, so it is not easily to be inferred. Uh, the second, the, the third example is, is the graphic model for uh, conformity biases. Uh, they will assume the user's rating values is generated by user interest and the conformity biases. And then in the, during the inference, they will cut off the effect of the conformity biases uh, so that user's preference can be, uh, so that their, their predictions can be uh, from the user's interest. Uh, the last example is uh, a click model for position biases. Uh, easy method will assume different uh, patterns of users of users uh, process this this these items. Uh, they may uh, process items from the top to the to the from the top one to the last ones until he found the found the items that they like uh, based on these processes. Uh, they can if they can learn user the true preference by optimizing the likelihood of the observed clicks. So uh, the above is the solutions for databases. Let's make a summary. Uh, there are three types of debugging methods. The first is the revision. It is uh, it is simple theoretical suddenness, but it may not address all biases. Also, it has some limitations. Uh, it requires it, it is it will suffer high variance and then requires positivity and uh, uh, it is not easy to set proper propensity. Also, uh, the second type of method is relabeling. Uh, it is uh, simple and general, but it is it will have it also has some limitations. Uh, also, I have discussed discussed we may can combine the rewriting and the relabeling. Uh, this method can inherit the merits of them. Uh, lastly, uh, we discuss the uh, generative modeling. Uh, this method uh, is uh, can leverage human prior knowledge and it is uh, uh, explainable. Also, it is, this, this model is hard to train and it relies on uh, strong assumptions uh, from, from human. Uh, also, we have discussed the the four, the four biases and discuss recent advances uh, to address these this, this four types of biases. Uh, now, uh, finally, I, we would like to discuss how the feedback loop uh, amplifies ampli ampli the biases. Uh, we know that the recommendation policy would affect the user behavior. Also, this effect will circle back into the model training. Uh, take the position biases as an example. Uh, top items uh, typically will receive more positive feedback, uh, which will in turn increases their ranking. 
uh, increase their rank rankings in the recommended list and uh, obtain more user feedback. And, uh, and then uh, this effect will, uh, will result in a rich get a richer scenario. Uh, many researchers also study the impact of the feedback loop on the item popularity. Uh, their simulated results uh, shows that the feedback loop will amplify the popularity biases, uh, as we can see from, uh, from this figure uh, with, the, with the feedback loop interactions uh, with the feedback loop interactions uh, increase, uh, we can find the average popularity of the of the recommendation list uh, will become large, uh, while the average diversity will uh, will become small. Uh, this uh, this result clearly uh, clearly shows the the feedback loop uh, will amplify the biases. Uh, to address this problem, a straightforward solution uh, is to cut off uh, this road uh, to isolate the effect of previous policy uh, on the collected data. Uh, a, straightforward, a straightforward way is to uh, collect uniform exposed data. Uh, we may can intervene the systems by using a, a random policy instead of a uh, normal recommendation policy, it will naturally address the feedback loop effect. Uh, however, uh, collecting uniform data with a uh, random policy is not a, a good strategy as it will hurt recommendation performance. Uh, we may can do things more smart. Uh, note that there exists an exploration and exploitation trade off in recommend systems where the exploitation is to recommend items that are predicted to better match user preference, uh, while, the, while the exploration uh, is to recommend items uh, randomly to collect more uh, unbiased user feedback uh, to best capture user preference. Uh, it can be formulated as a bandit problem uh, to find the best strategy. Uh, to deal with this problem, a large number of work uh, explores interactive recommendation. Uh, that can interact with the user and dynamically uh, capture his preference uh, to update the recommendation strategy. Uh, as we can see, uh, they usually formulate the problem as the reinforcement learning. Uh, different from traditional recommendation methods, uh, reinforcement learning will formulate the problem as a sequential uh, interactions between the systems and the users. Uh, during the interactions, the agent will uh, continually update its, its strategy according to user history feedback and generates a list of items uh, that best match user preference or explore user's uh, preference uh, based on some uh, uniform uh, policy for long-term reward. Uh, this is the key difference between the reinforcement learning from the uh, traditional recommendation methods uh, it would explore user's preference, uh, not just not just improve the current recommendation accuracy, but also uh, improve model uh, for future uh, and the and the future recommendation accuracy. Uh, so uh, now let's discuss some um, future directions uh, with the aforementioned descriptions. We can find that existing methods are usually designed for uh, address, for just addressing uh, one or two specific biases. Uh, we know that in a real world recommend systems, uh, there are always uh, contain many different types of, of biases. Uh, we it means that it is important to uh, design a general uh, debugging framework to handle various biases. Uh, and even their combinations. Uh, also, auto debugs uh, can address uh, this problem, but uh, it requires uniform data. And we know that the uniform data is not easily uh, collected. The application, the, the application of auto debugs is constrained. So I think it's time to explore a more general framework to address this problem. Uh, I think relabeling and relabeling plus re reweighting is a promising direction uh, to address this problem. 
uh, but we need to uh, explore uh, general parameter learning algorithms uh, to address this problem. Uh, the second uh, future directions, I think, is to leverage the knowledge graph uh, to, uh, to address a basic problem. Uh, we know that uh, leveraging the site information uh, could improve the uh, performance of the basic. Uh, it would be promising to export the knowledge graph for the basic. Uh, knowledge graph uh, contains rich human prior knowledge, uh, which could be useful to understand the data databases. Uh, also, uh, the knowledge graph can, uh, can give uh, an expandable uh, uh, recommendation results. So uh, I think knowledge graph is a, is a powerful tool to address both spaces and, uh, and to give the expandable results. Uh, the third future directions I think is is the uh, dynamic biases. We know that in real world, uh, biases are usually dynamic rather than static. For example, uh, the the function of the clothes uh, will change day and night. Also, users uh, every day will exper experiment many new items and get new friends. And it means that users. Uh, the ex it means that users uh, the exposure users exposure will uh, will change every day. Uh, so uh, I think uh, these factors would make the biases uh, not get not uh, all biases will evolve with the time going by. It will be interesting and valuable to explore uh, how biases evolves with time and analyzes how the dynamic biases affects the recommendation systems. Also, I think we need to develop an online updating strategy of the debasing parameters. Uh, it will be more efficiently, and it, is, it, and it can be applied in the real world uh, recommend systems. Also, uh, I think another important problem is how to evaluate uh, or recommend the uh, systems offline. Uh, we know that uh, uniform data is a, a golden standard on best information, uh, but its small scale make it uh, difficult to evaluate uh, recommendation models uh, due to, it, it, due to uh, it will be very high, it will be uh, very, uh, very unstable and uh, the estimation will be full of uh, variance. I think it's, it's time to exploring, uh, I think it's time to explore new, uh, evaluate, new evaluators uh, using uh, large scale bias data and uh, the small scale unbiased data. Uh, I think it will be uh, interesting directions uh, to design uh, new, uh, new evaluate mechanisms to evaluate the recommendation performance. Uh, also, we can find different work usually adopted uh, different evaluation metrics, especially for popularity biases or unfairness. Uh, this, pre pre this will create an uh, inconsistent reporting of, of the scores. Um, we can find in recommend, si recommend systems, uh, different authors usually uh, report their own results. Uh, the performance or the uh, the performance of existing methods uh, can cannot be well understood or not or not easily to be compared. Uh, as such, uh, we believe that a suit for uh, I believe that a suit of benchmark data sets and uh, new evaluation metrics uh, should be proposed, and it is very important uh, for recommendation comparison. Uh, also, uh, that's all for the first part of our tutorial. Uh, we hope this tutorial could help you to uh, better understand the recommendation biases. And also, uh, I hope you, this tutorial may inspire your more ideas on this topic. We also present a survey of the recommendation biases. Uh, if you are interested in this area, uh, we highly recommend you to refer to our surveys. Uh, the survey will provide more details of recent advances. Uh, 
Uh, also, we have prepared a GitHub web that, uh, that organizes recent advances and their codes. Uh, I hope uh, this web set would uh, benefit you uh, to do research on this area. Okay, uh, thank you for your listening. Uh, I, I think there may be, uh, maybe let, there may be not enough time to give uh, to give the answers, to give answers for all your questions. But don't worry, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, send an email to us. Uh, we will give you feedback as soon as possible. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, th thank you very much. Let's let's take a couple more questions now before the break. Um, so I'm looking to see if anybody in the hall would like to step to the mic. Um, and uh, so those are really great resources that you that you that you shared with us. Uh, yeah, we have one question uh, coming from the hall. Yeah. So hello. I think it's fine. Um, I'm Manel. I have um, three questions. I hope they yes. are fast, three I questions think. coming from the hall. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you can just give me a brief conversation, and then we can keep going by email or in the hub. One is about okay. the, so the imputation. You said a lot about data imputation. Is this data imputation similar or different from the generative models? Can we consider data imputation as a generation, data generation technique? Uh, okay, uh, I think it's a good question, uh, as we can see. Uh, in many, uh, in many generative, in many gener generative models, they will uh, they will uh, they will assume a model to generate the missing data. Of course, I think this is a type of uh, data imputations. I think so. Yes. Th th that's a nice question because somebody was also asking that about the imputation uh, live. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, go. Oh, so yeah, go on, go on. Okay. So my next one is. Um, I agree with uniform distribution, but what do you think if we can mimic the global rating distribution instead of the uniform distribution? Would you think it can be a good direction? A global rating distribution can be taken from the uh, real data. Uh, I'm sorry, could you please uh, replace, reply your, uh, yes. could you please repeat your question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I miss your questions. No, I'm it's sorry. okay. So my question is that I saw you, we, we use uniform distribution and it seems we have yeah. a good results, but did, do you know yeah. or did you try or would you think that using a global rating distribution, so we have the observed real rating from users, for, for instance, there are 60% uh, four stars. We have those ratings, real distribution, and we can uh, generate ratings from the global rating distribution instead of the uniform distribution. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, I think it is not, I think it's a, it's a hard question to answer. Yeah, this, uh, this, this one, maybe, maybe we, we Take it offline because there's there's also the question of what the uniform distribution is in this this context. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I keep going with the third. Third. One. Third and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So the third is I think I just your second question uh, in email. Okay. Yeah. I need I need some time to think about this question. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's no fine. Worries. So the last one is just the learning and. The conformity bias, you said when a user is trying to uh, behave like other users and not his own yeah, yeah. judgment. So how this happen with a group recommendation? Is, is this common uh, bias for group recommender systems? Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, the group, I think uh, it, uh, it will happen in group recommendations. Uh, the group recommendations uh, need to uh, combine different users' opinions to make recommendations. Uh, to make recommendations. Uh, so I think it may be an interesting topic uh, when we make uh, group recommendations uh, to study the conformity effect uh, in, this, in this situation. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have another um, person uh, from the room who, who sat down temporarily after hearing there was going to be three questions. Okay, he's coming to the mic. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, thanks for, for the talk. It was, it was great. Uh, I was wondering about the uh, generative processes that you have uh, described so far. Uh, in one place you have mentioned that uh, you, during the learning phase, you are factoring in explicitly the bias into your graphical model. And then on the inference stage, you are somehow cutting the link between the, the output variable, as far as I remember, and the node representing the bias, right? I was wondering if you could give some insights how, what are the mechanisms of doing that? Uh, okay. Uh, I think uh, it is a very good question. Uh, uh, I, I would like to take uh, this example. Uh, as we can see, uh, the, the user rating values is generated based on uh, user's interest and uh, community biases. Uh, so when we make predictions, uh, we will cut off this effect and make prediction just based on user interest. Uh, also, for uh, another example, uh, for, as we can see this, uh, another example, we can see the generative model for the exposure biases. Uh, we observe the observed data uh, will be affected by the exposure uh, exposure uh, model and uh, the preference model. Uh, when we uh, make predictions, we just make predictions uh, based on the preference models, and we will remove the effect of the exposure models. Uh, also, I think uh, to better understand these mechanisms, maybe we can use the causal inference. Uh, it will be introduced in the in the second sections thank you yeah, got it thank you very much and, yeah uh, so just one more quick question from online uh, then we have um, just in general now looking back at the first uh, half of this tutorial somebody's asking about um, are you worried about as you correct for bias you're introducing new and and, and different bias or what do you think about that? We're, we're, we're now trying to address bias, but have we accidentally introduced other bias that we're not aware of, or, or could we measure it somehow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Isha is a very interesting and good person. Uh, I always like to use this sentence because I think Isha is a very good person. Uh, I, when we, but I would like to use the example to show this effect. Uh, when we uh, uh, data imputation, yeah, here. Uh, when we use relabeling for the uh, to to address language biases, uh, if we give a uh, wrong. Uh, give a wrong uh, wrong values to the to the imputed to the imputed values uh, to the to the missing data. Uh, of course, we will introduce the other biases and we'll make the uh, and we'll the and we'll make the model uh, towards the wrong region. Uh, of course, uh, when we give the wrong parameters for for weightings and uh, uh, and the and the pseudo labels, of course, uh, we will get, we will maybe we will amplify the biases. So, uh, how to evaluate this effect? I think we, you may can use the uh, you may can evaluate the model on test data or the validation data. Uh, I think it is uh, uh, it is a golden sta standard for evaluating the model. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. So um, we have a couple of people online, so really interesting and helpful tutorial um, coming from Nava Tenterev, and uh, also thanks for such a detailed discussion on the topic um, from Anastasia Sutkova. So let's, um, let's thank um, Joe. <laughs> for your listening. And, We'll have a 15-minute break, and we'll be back here for the second half of the of the of the tutorial. Then.
We are, we, we are welcoming you back now uh, to the tutorial on bias issues and solutions in recommender systems. Uh, so uh, we are very happy now uh, to continue uh, with uh, Fu Li Feng from the National University of Singapore. Uh, and he's going to be talking to us about popularity bias characteristics and and solutions. So we'll do the same thing. Um, please, uh, live, uh, or sorry, virtual participants, please ask the questions in the live chat. I'll monitor those. Um, and then at the, <clears throat> at, the, at, the, at, the, at the juncture between the two speakers, we'll take uh, questions uh, then. And uh, somebody uh, during the first half was worried that I was uh, was was falling victim to some kind of uh, um, selection bias or an exposure bias. So I am looking at the upvotes, um, but your question does have a chance of getting asked, uh, even if it doesn't get radically upvoted. And remember that um, questions can uh, also be asked asynchronously on the page of the tutorial within the hub. Um, after the tutorial, maybe you're going back and watching this video, so you can still ask questions there. Uh, and so your question will not get lost. So please, let's have lots of, uh, lots of questions in the live chat. And now, without further ado, I pass the fo floor to Flu Fu Li Feng. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Fu Li Feng. Uh, it's really a pity uh, that I, I cannot join the, join the conference um, physically. Um, but it's a, it is a very different experience and a very interesting experience for us, right? Because currently, I mean, Singapore, uh, we are, the season is always summer. As, as you can see, um, this is the view outside my window. Uh, it is raining now. <laughs> but I, I guess uh, the real venue, it, it should be some different season, like autumn or this thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So let's start for the uh, for the second part about the uh, about the popularity bears. Uh, here are two uh, two well known definitions for popularity bears. Uh, the first one is more about um, it's more from a perspective of fairness. It, it's something it, it discussed about whether the recommend, recommendation algorithm. Uh, uh, gives uh, unfair favors over the, over the items, for example, and, uh, and, and, and favors some uh, very uh, popular items and frequently recommend them. And another definition is uh, uh, emphasize is more about amplification. It means that uh, the, from this per perspective, we admit that the, uh, the interaction uh, over item is uneven. But uh, we, we, we don't want the recommender system to, uh, to over amplify the, uh, over amplify the head tail and, um, and ignore the, the long tail. So this is roughly about the popularity bias in recommender system. And we think there are two, uh, there are two sources uh, for, the, for, the, for the popularity bias. Um, the one source is, is the is the uh, is from uh, is, uh, is the uh, is the underlying data. That is to say, the 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 uh, user historical interactions we use of, uh, for training recommended system is uh, typically uh, typically has a has an, an even has a an even uh, distribution over the items, uh, as can be seen uh, from these two uh, public data sets. For the uh, for the top twenty uh, for the uh, top twenty percent for the twenty percent of the most popular items, uh, they will they will take more than uh, sixty or more than eighty uh, in historical interactions. And another sor source of uh, popularity bias is the uh, is is, uh, is from the algorithm. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, there are some uh, some numbers uh, from the recommendation result uh, to uh, depict this picture. We uh, split the uh, we sub split the items into nine groups, and for each group, 
uh, we let we let the each group have the equal number uh, have the same number of interactions in the training data, and then uh, we uh, we count the uh, count the frequency of the occurrence uh, of each group in the recommended list, and we cut uh, we cut each cut the recommended list of each user at top 50. As can be seen, um, even though we split the uh, split the the items into uh, into even uh, groups, the uh, the the algorithm largely uh, prefers the popular group. So this I this, this uh, these are the sources. These are the sources of popularity bias, and uh, we all know that they, um, this this uh, popularity bias will affect uh, will. Uh, Will uh, will amplify the interest for uh, popular items, and will it, it will make the uh, the popular items become more popular because it is is uh, it is recommended more frequently. Then it result in the uh, some massive effect, some negative massive effect. We don't uh, expect the system. Uh, we don't expect uh, that are not expected, and from the user side. It it can also uh it can also uh, it can also uh lead to recommendation that cannot uh cannot uh really satisfy the user interest. Uh, for example, for some user who are, uh who typically uh, who typically interact uh unpopular items, and if the recommender system recommend a lot of popular item uh to to such user, it may may not satisfy the uh, the preference of such user. And in the in the literature, there are typically uh, there are mainly three kinds of methods for handling the popularity bias. Uh, the first one is the first category is uh, performs ranking adjustment, which aims to uh, which which aims to uh, which aims to revise the recommendation list. Uh, generated by a uh, uh, typical uh, by an existing recommender model, such as uh, metric factorization and uh, and all of the following deep models. And another one is uh, one another uh, category of methods want to handle this uh, popularity bias from the uh, embedding uh, embedding perspective, because as we as we all know, um, for, for the modern uh, recommender system. Most of the models relies uh, uses uh, inviting to represent users and item, and the uh, the third way uh, is uh, that the the third category of methods leverage causal inference, uh, where the core idea is to control the causal effect of popularity on the uh, on the recommendation score, and then uh, then I will introduce these three uh, three three types of methods one by one. Here comes the uh, the first uh, the the first uh, ranking adjustment method. It, it, it performs regularization uh, during uh, recommender model training. And so this, this is the typical recommendation loss which is used for recommendation and it also includes the uh, the regular regularization such as the L2 norm to prevent overfitting. And the second term is uh, incorporated to uh, adjust uh, the recommendation list and uh, from the uh, popularity uh, from the popularity perspective. Uh, roughly, it controls um, it it encourages the uh, the model to recommend uh, recommend some unpopular items. For example, there is there is one way to uh, construct this regulation term. Um, you can omit this this metric form. You can just uh, uh just uh, uh you can just uh, go to this uh, detail one. Uh, here uh, here item I J are two. Uh, here I J uh, denotes two items, and D I J is whether this uh whether this uh the popularity of the two items are equal. So uh this term uh, this term uh will this term will be large. If the uh, if the uh, recommendation list, and for example, the top twenty, uh, the, 
for example, the top 20 of the recommend mentioned list are all uh, popular items. And I encourage the model to, um, to miss some or to uh, replace some popular item with unpopular, uh, unpopular one, so as to minimize this, this term. And another one is, is another way to construct this regulation term is decorrelation. So um, here P and Q are the embedding, uh, let's say uh, this is a uh, the uh, micro factorization model. And here P and Q are unit and item embeddings. And we calculate the recommendation score from the inner product. And then this is a recommend, uh, this is to minimize the correlation between the ranking uh, between the ranking score and the correlation uh, and the correlation or uh, and the ranking uh, ranking calculated by item popularity and so as to um, to promote some unpopular items into uh, to the top of the recommendation list so this is regularization which uh, which uh, perform, which uh, influenced the uh, training phase of the recommendation system and another way to perform ranking adjustment is uh, is, is performing re-ranking, uh, which which uh, which is at the at the inference stage or at the testing stage of the uh, recommender model. Um, typically, the target uh, or typically the uh, ranking the re-ranking is formulated as a as a uh, as this objective. Um, this is uh, this is the original uh, original uh, recommendation score, and here is another term uh, which aims to adjusting the order of the original ranking to consider the item popularity. Uh, also, there are two ways. There are two widely used ways to uh, construct this second term. Uh, one way is popularity combination. And the idea is quite simple. Uh, it just uh, it just uh, downweight the downweight the uh, the popular items uh, with with the reverse uh, with the reverse of the uh, item popularity. And another one is a uh, is list smoothing. Um, this this formula is a bit uh, comp complicated, but the idea is quite simple. Um, so we can uh, we can view this in two parts. The second part is in the current rec uh, recommendation system. Let's say, for example, the top top ten of the of the uh, of the output of the current model. And if uh, we can calculate the ratio of of popular items, for example, we we take the uh, we take the most uh, most uh, we, we take the top 20% items of as popular item and the remaining as unpopular items. And then we can calculate the ratio uh, of popular items to unpopular items uh, within, the, within the current, uh, current recommendation list. And then this is the, the reverse of the ratio. Let's say if, if the current, uh, current list only contains popular items, then the probability of this term is zero. And so to maximize this uh, objective, uh, we encourage uh, with this second term, we encourage the, uh, the algorithm to revise some popular items with unpopular ones. So this is the idea of re-ranking. And here's come comes the, uh, the second, the, the second uh, category, uh, caudal embedding. And to learn caudal embedding, I typically uh, utilize the caudal specific data. And uh, some of the, some of them, uh, the, this caudal specific data, uh, most, uh, most of caudal specific data used uh, by, this, uh, by these algorithms is similar as the uh, as the data as a random random data um, introduced by Java. And uh, one famous method under uh, this category is caudal e. And the idea of caudal e is also very simple. So we we have the 
we have the uh, the Belcher data that is the real uh, real historical user item interactions and and some even data uh, as to popularity bears the even data is is a uh, is a resampling of this uh, of this discard data so as the uh, interaction has an even distribution over the items and we use this two sets of training data to to uh, learn two different uh, user item embeddings and uh, we uh, use some uh, regulation term to connect these two models so as the, uh, these two models can align e with each other on the modeling of the user pre pre preference part. So this is the idea of Codo E. But the, but the uh, and, and, uh, in the last year, uh, there is a new work uh, named DICE uh, under this category. And this is uh, instead of uh, instead of generating some unreal um, and real unbiased data, because we all know that uh, the, for the the uh, the interaction over item uh, in the real world is not uh, cannot be a be a be an even distribution. So uh, we may uh, it, may, it might be uh, unrealistic to uh, to to use such unbiased data to train a model, and so the they just uh, uh, they just uh, use the real uh, use the real uh, user item interactions, but uh, consider popularity during the uh, the sampling of this uh, in during the sampling of uh, training training data, and the idea is is quite similar to Codo E. Um, in this model, there are still two sets of user item embeddings, and uh, and there are several losses to uh, to optimize the this to learn this uh, embeddings, which is also similar to Codoi. But the data they used are all from the real uh, user item interactions, and. Let's see the details of data. There are there uh, there are three uh, three sets of data, or or they, they categorize the training data into three uh, into three sets. The one is the whole training set. That will say the 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 real historical uh, user item interactions, and a subset of this whole training set is the is the sample is the samples uh, of a user item triples uh, where the positive uh, positive samples are less popular than the negative samples uh, so because they think they think they uh, the, the click data is generated by or is affected by two factors the real user interest the real matching between the user interest and item features and the popularity so um, for this kind of training data, we can we can think that the click is mainly uh, is mainly uh, resulted uh, or resulted in by the user interest because the positive item has, is less po less popular than uh, than the negative one. So they use this uh, this uh, subset of the training data to learn the. Uh, the user item inviting under uh, the, the interest user item inviting. And they also, uh, there is also a popularity uh, inviting. Uh, so they, uh, they sample, they, sam they, they use another uh, subset of the training data to learn the popularity part. And where the positive samples are more popular than negative samples. And we, we think uh, within this uh, this uh, this triples and the popularity has larger might has uh, might have larger effect on the click. So we uh, minimize the uh, BPR loss or the recommendation loss over this uh, sub subset. But we also uh, maximize the uh, the BPR loss 
over the uh, over the the first subset where the uh, where the the where the uh, the negative sample is more popular than the positive one. So we reverse uh, reverse the the direction of the loss. And so this is this is a dice and uh, with with this uh, with this sampling uh, sampling strategies we uh, we doesn't use the real data but different subsets to train different embeddings rather than uh, generating some unrealistic uh, unbiased data. So this is the advantage of this method. And recently uh, there are also uh, uh, there are also um, methods from the codo, codo inference perspective. And as mentioned by uh, Jave, um, uh, there, the, these methods are typically uh, in two uh, different, different uh, subsets. Uh, the one is uh, introduced, like, like, like introduced uh, by Jave, they use the uh, inverse propensity weighting. Um, and the other side uses intervention and counterfactual. And this is because uh, in caudal theory, there are two popular frameworks for caudal theory. One is, one, uh, one is proposed by Donald Rubin, uh, which is named as potential outcome. Another, uh, another framework is caudal graph, uh, which is proposed by Judy Gore. And similar as the methods introduced by Jave and to uh, handle to handle popularity bars with uh, inverse propensity score, um, the idea is it, also very simple. We just uh, uh, we just uh, calculate some propensity score that is uh, that is uh, closely related to item popularity. For example, we can use item popularity as this propensity score, and then we can uh, let them uh, we can uh, let the model uh, to focus more on the unbar uh, unpopular uh, methods, uh, unpopular uh, items during model training, and then to uh, to mitigate the the popularity bias. And before I introduce the uh, the caudal inference or caudal, uh, before I introduce the uh, the the methods that use the uh, caudal intervention or counterfactual inference, uh, I, I want to introduce some basic com concepts under the uh, under this caudal framework. Um, the core of this uh, of this framework is a caudal graph, uh, which represents. Uh, which represents how the data are generated or or how the variables uh, affect each other during the generation of the data. Here uh, in this color graph, each uh, node represents a variable. For example, the y uh, could be uh, could be the whether the user and item will interact with each other and x could be the uh, user item feature. And so uh, the direction of the arrows means uh, this variable x will affect the value of of y. So this graph is uh, uh, this is caudal graph. And one key concept in uh, in Juniper's framework is uh, is intervention. Uh, so as mentioned uh, by by Jave, so uh, to to uh, to estimate the the caudal effect uh, from one variable x to the uh, to the outcome variable or the target variable y, and typically we use like the medicine or the uh, like the medicine. Uh, typically we do uh, we do random like uh, randomized controlled experiments to compare the to compare the for example the group uh, that takes the drug or the group uh, that didn't take the drug. And so uh, this concept is intervention. And uh, as to this concept, uh, uh, when, we, uh, when we view this, uh, this, uh, this operation uh, in this uh, caudal graph, 
it means we cut off the all of the variables that can affect the treatment variable x. It means we uh, forcefully set the uh, variable x as some value, and we cut off all of its parent uh, nodes that can affect it. And uh, here I give you a very famous example uh, that uh, typically used in color inference. And here X represents the uh, chocolate consumption of a country. And Y uh, uh, represents the, the number of Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize winners over the, over, for example, 10 million populations uh, in that country. And they is the, uh, they, for example, the GDP of that country. Um, so uh, when we, when we, when we can, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can observe that. So uh, for us in the, for example, in the last century, so chocolate is, is some, is some, uh, is some, some expensive food. So uh, only the countries, only the rich countries, uh, can consume a lot of a, a lot of chocolate. So there is the 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 GDP of the country affects the uh, the the amount of chocolate consumption, and also the, the rich countries invest a lot of money on uh, on research or, and then they uh there there are there are more Nobel Prize winners in that country, so this. Uh, this variable they affect both x and y. And here uh, we give a, a formal definition about uh, about causal effect. As mentioned before, the the causal effect is is so let's say it's the difference. Uh, it's a difference or or it's a difference uh, on it's a difference on y when we change. The treatment from the reference letters to the to the expected letters. Uh, for example, the 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 the, uh, the reference letters could be uh, could be uh, didn't take the drug. Uh, the uh, the expected letters is taking the drug. And then um, here comes to the uh, so so we use this term. Uh, as the we use this term to represent the probability of y when we forcefully set the value, uh, the the treatment variable as the expected value. And here is a uh, here is a uh, uh, here is the difference between uh, these two terms. So this is the uh, the regular term we are very familiar with is the conditional probability, and so. Uh, in this case, we are the uh, we are uh, a, a variable z uh, that affects both x and y. Um, the correlation when we estimate the correlation, we we use this term. We can expand this uh, this uh, conditional probability as this one. And here comes the difference between the correlation. And the uh, post intervention probability, which is typically viewed as causal effect. Um, so here we uh, we calculate the relation between y and uh, x and z under the natural distribution of this z. And when we calculate correlation, cor uh, correlation, we uh, calculate this uh, this uh, this expectation the expectation of this uh, conditional probability over this conditional probability. So um, this, uh, and the, the difference between these two is, this is the natural uh, distribution of the, but this one condition, uh, this one condition, conditions on the, uh, the treatment variable. For example, if this is, uh, uh, if this Z is, uh, is item popularity and then if X is a very popular item, this uh, probability will be very large. And then the, uh, the, pro the, pro the probability uh, correspond to popular item will be enlarged. 
and then so they uh, then the popular items will uh, will have a higher score. But in this way, this is the natural diffusion of the so it will it won't be affected by this uh, variable x. And then uh, we come to another con concept about counterfactual. And counterfactual uh, is a imagination is an imagination uh, that doesn't really exist. So it's something like uh, given the real uh, status, and we imagine if the, uh, for example, if the value of this, um, we if the value of this uh, variable has changed, then what are the outcome would be? And uh, here the here the the most important thing is when we calculate the value of y uh, under this counterfactual status. We need to use the uh, the assumed value of this value. So th this formula is very important, uh, which will be used in the following. And here are the, all of the basic concepts uh, uh, used in uh, in the following uh, in the following uh, presentation. And if you are familiar, if you are interested in uh, color inference, uh, I would like to recommend this uh, this book and. You will find all of the details. And here uh, comes the uh, the first work that use this kind of uh, counterfactual inference or intervention to handle uh, popularity bias. And first, uh, this work gives a color view of the popularity bias in recommendation, and which is very uh, very simple. It uses the direct edge from the item to the oh sorry there should be to to y to the uh, recommendation score to represent the popularity bias that is to say popular items uh, popular items is is, uh, is directly uh, assigned a higher recommendation score and there is also another another direct edge from the user to the to the recommendation score which uh, represents to what extent the user is sensitive to popularity. And so uh, similar as this, they, they want to, uh, they want to uh, estimate the, uh, they want to estimate the true user interest over the item. Uh, so they, uh, so, uh, when making uh, when making recommendation or when calculating a recommendation score, they want to eliminate or deduct the effect of popularity from the uh, recommendation score. So this is the idea of this work. Um, so uh, to achieve this target, they they simply uh, make two predictions. The uh, the first one is the factual prediction. Um, it's just, it's just the outcome of a normal recommender model. And then uh, they conduct, they deduct the, the second one, uh, the, which is a counterfactual prediction that reflects uh, the causal effect of the uh, item popularity on the recommendation score, which corresponds to this, uh, this uh, counterfactual uh, causal graph. We are the uh, in this graph, the atom popularity has two uh, has two passes to affect the recommendation score. One is the direct one, which is the popularity bias. Another one is uh, is the matching between the user uh, interest or item popularity, and so uh, we want to estimate uh, estimate this uh, the causal effect passes through this direct pass. So we just set this variable uh, into a into a into a reference status. For example, the average uh, the average uh, matching between the uh, between the user items uh, over all of the interactions, or just a, just a use a zero um, item representation to calculate to uh, to calculate the reference status. Then uh, under this situation. Uh, just like the, the one we I pre, uh, introduced in this slide, we just uh, use this reference data uh, 
into uh, without uh, feed feed this uh, reference data into this uh, recommended model, and then we calculate the cal uh, the corresponding outcome, which is the uh, which is the counterfactual prediction, and we just simply uh, deduct this uh, counterfactual prediction from the factual one. Then we can uh, we can eliminate the effect of item popularity. So this is all of the this work. And so uh, in in the pre all of the uh, previously introduced work, they want to they want to uh, they want to uh, eliminate the uh, the effect, or they 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 only consider the effect of item popularity on the prediction score, but uh, we find that uh, the item popularity also affects the probability that an item is uh, is is poor, or the the is uh, the exposure probability of an item. So uh, here comes a more, uh, a different uh, color graph, and in this graph, uh, in this color graph, uh, there is also there is still a direct pass from the item popularity to the uh, to the uh, recommended score, but there is also a pass from the item popularity to the to the item. And uh, like the uh, so uh, so in this work, uh, we can use uh, intervention to uh, to remove the effect of this item popularity on this uh, on this recommendation score and uh, formally uh, the formal uh, the uh, the formula of this estimation is uh, it's just uh, can be uh, can be written as uh, the probability the post intervention probability uh, when we uh, forcefully uh, is uh, expose one item and similarly uh, the difference between uh, this post intervention probability and the previous uh, the the previous correlation more uh, is the uh, is that the last term or the or the distribution to calculate the expectation of this conditional distribution. And when we calculate the uh, the expectation of uh, condition of this uh, conditional uh, probability over the natural distribution of the then uh, we can. Uh, we can we can uh, we can omit the effect of this variable on on the uh, on the recommended score. And to achieve or to model this uh, this post intervention probability, uh, because there are two uh, components in this probability, so to to uh, to estimate this probability, we need to estimate two parts. One is this uh, conditional probability, and another one is to uh, calculate this summation. And to uh, it is very simple to estimate the first uh, the first part because uh, typically we use a random uh, recommendation model. Uh, the oh, most of the existing recommendation model they uh, estimate this uh, correlation or this conditional probability. So. Uh, here the difference is only one more condition, so we just uh, simply uh, simply combine the original uh, recommended model with one more term. That is the uh, that is the uh, item popularity at the state t or time step t, and so we use uh, this uh, formula to estimate the uh, this probability, and then. Uh, to calculate the second term, we just uh, uh, we can just uh, uh, we can just uh, calculate each probability or each outcome of this formula under a value of the. But th this is very time consuming, so we use uh, we use uh, an approximation, uh, which uh, which just uh, uh, which just uh, uh, replace. Uh, replace the uh, variable day with the expectation of the uh, when we calculate it. 
and then we can calculate the this uh, we can estimate this summation with only one one times of forward propagation and then we use uh, we use this uh, this probability to 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 uh, to run them uh, to make uh, atom recommendation so um, in 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 summary so during model training we learn this conditional probability and we use this formula to estimate it. Uh, that to say we use the historical interactions to optimize uh, to uh, to optimize the parameters and then uh, when we uh, after after the learning we use this formula to make uh, to make recommendation so this is the idea of the popularity decomponing and uh, even though um, we can use we can uh, we can make rec uh, with this uh, with this uh, post intervention probability we can uh, make recommendation uh, without the uh, effect of atom popularity but uh, in sometimes um, we need to inject some desired popularity because uh, from the user perspective we always want the recommendation system to recommend the the item that matches my interest but from the perspective of the platform um, the platform wants the system uh, or wa want to optimize the click through rate or want to uh, want the uh, want the uh, users to be more active so in some uh, in some cases we also need to inject some de desired popularity and it, 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 this uh, target can also be easily achieved uh, under this framework, which where we just uh, uh, we we just uh, uh, we just uh, replace uh, replace this uh, atom popularity with a predictive one. For example, we can use some popularity prediction uh, or time series modeling methods to predict the future atom popularity, and then we use this. Uh, as we replace, we use the predict item popularity to uh, calculate the recommended score. Um, here are some experimental results about uh, most of this uh, about this uh, this methods for handling uh, item popularity, and we tested this uh, this methods on three uh, public data sets. And so here, uh, this this is the uh, this is the uh, item pop, and this is the uh, uh, and all of these methods are based on uh, MF micro factorization, and this is the uh, vanilla MF, and these two methods are the ranking adjustment one, and this one is the color inviting one. And here is the result. Uh, as can be seen, the uh, the ranking adjustment method. Uh, and both the ranking adjustment uh, method and the uh, codo embedding method and the uh, codo inference method can uh, handle the popularity bias or can eliminate the popularity from, to some extent. Uh, and among these methods, the uh, the codo inference one, that is say the deconfounded training one, uh, achieves the, best, the better performance. And again, we uh, we show the we analyze the recommendation result, and we uh, we count the frequency of these ten groups, ten item groups, uh, at, uh, within the top fifty of each uh, each user's recommendation list. And here is the original uh, original uh, original uh, uh, MF. Uh, where is a uh, there is a clear amplification over uh, the popular groups. And this is the color embedding one. That's, um, as can be seen, uh, is, uh, the amplification issue is, uh, the amplification issue is, uh, is not, uh, or is, uh, it's not that severe, uh, but it suffers the uh, it suffers the popular group to achieve this target, and this red line is the deconfounded one, which is much closer 
to this uh, even distribution. Again, it shows that the decompounding method is more helpful. And lastly, uh, uh, we tested the, uh, the one with the adjustment and we compare with the one, the methods that uh, uses, uh, uses, uh, uses item popularity. Again, this method uh, achieved the better performance. I think I'm running out all of the methods and then I just give, give a quick, uh, quick conclusion. That is to say the heuristic methods like the working adjustment, which, are, which, which uh, cannot perform good. And uh, for, the, for the causal value methods, which rely on embedded data, which may, not, uh, which may be hard for, for getting such data. And for the causal inference methods, which, uh, which, is, uh, which, is typically, uh, which can typically achieve uh, good performance. And then for paternal directions, we can uh, consider uh, popularity bias at final green. Uh, we, here are two, uh, two attempts uh, done by our group. And we can also consider multiple uh, behaviors, for example, click and like uh, when handling popularity bias. And we, all, we can also consider use item features when considering popularity bars. And uh, as the color inference method is the most uh, effective one, so uh, potential, uh, potential direction is to, uh, to accurately estimate the color effect. So that's all for this part. Is there any question? Or I directly pass to the pass to Wang Xiang for the third third part. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Do we have questions from anybody uh, in the room? Uh, please do step to the microphone, and and ask them. And uh, please give me ten seconds. I need to uh, bring my uh, bring my. <laughs> By putting my charger. Oh, okay. Otherwise, my laptop will be yeah, back. Yeah, we see that. Oh, okay, sorry. that's good. No, no worries. No worries. Um, does anybody want to, in the meantime, uh, step to the, step to the, so please, we're, we're having a really, he really wanted to be here, and we're having a really realistic uh, experience, too. That's nice. Um, any, do you have any questions? Um, we have some questions coming from online. More questions coming from online. Okay. Oops. Any questions? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, let's see. So uh, let, let's just get your slide displayed again here, because we see, still see your battery warning. Is is that visible on your screen? Uh, is, is it uh, okay? It's okay now. It's only yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, now. great. Uh, so uh, there, great. Thanks, Todd. Um, so uh, in terms of this outlook. Uh, some pe um, online people, someone was asking about um, a bias in online learning. And is this something, do you think, okay, we've solved this or does this belong in your potential directions? Could you comment about, on oh, um, about addressing bias in online learning? I, um, I think, I think it is, uh, uh, this is my personal perspective, I, I guess, uh, this question is not only related to popularity bias. Yeah. It, uh, it seems that uh, it is discussing about all of the bias uh, issue under the online learning uh, setting. So uh, in such a case, I think uh, the on online learning is helpful for handling bias because uh, online learning uh, under uh, online learning. Uh, we actually consider another, dimen or another uh, dimension, that is the time. So we can, we can uh, observe uh, how, the, uh, how the virus is uh, changing along the time. 
the, which is a very important uh, information or signal for handling the virus. So I think uh, online learning would be helpful for uh, handling virus, especially in this recommendation system uh, where, the, where the data come uh, a long time. Okay, um, thanks. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, do uh, visit the tutorial page on the Hub uh, for uh, more questions. If I mangled your question, um, you can also re-ask it there, and and the, the um, tutorial presenters can come back and ask it later. And in fact, I'd like to ask you, as the tutorial printer uh, presenters, um, there's there was a URL for your slides uh, for for. Um, Jiao Wei's uh, part, if you could put that in a live Q&A, that would be nice. Somebody was asking for that, um, the link to the slides, um, and it flashed up on the screen. So if uh, yeah. it doesn't- So maybe doesn't I just, a, just a post a question uh, yeah, yeah. To, to post this slide. Yeah, just, just dump it in the a live um, Q&A, and then everybody can see the, um, the link. Um, and, so we have one more question. Uh, Someone is asking like, okay, I want to address popularity bias. We just saw a, a really b bunch of great approaches, um, but practically speaking, where would you advise to start? Uh, you. What, what, uh, what we, what sorry, we, could you please repeat yeah, the yeah, question? Yeah, sure. What, what, under, in, your, in your opinion, if, if I want to address popularity bias, what, what's the best place to start? Just the. Um, you know, if I have a practical problem with it, um, with with popularity bias, what would I do first? Um, I, I think uh, I think uh, the best choice is the is to is to uh, is to test this uh, PD first. Okay. Yes, the, the best choice is to test this PD first. Uh, if it works uh, works as uh, expected, then uh, you can try uh, PDA. Uh, the, this is one, the PDA. Uh, this, this two methods from the same paper uh, published in, the, uh, in this year, in the CIGAR conference of this year. Okay, great. Um, thanks and a lot. And it, it achieves quite good performance, um, both in this offline data and the online performance. Okay, um, thank, thanks a lot, thanks. Uh, so now, um, well, I just wanted to say that um, we have a comment from the live Q&A Awesome, somebody said. So that's really, really great feedback. And we're now ready for our, um, our third and final segment of the tutorial. Is that correct? Uh, so we wanted to, to welcome um, Zhang Wang for the third and final. Okay, so just, uh, just some housekeeping. So I, th I think we are gonna go over today because we, we do wanna get um, everybody in. Uh, we wanna get, we wanna finish it up. If, if, you, um, if you decide to, to join the lunch um, at that moment, then that's fine. Just uh, when, you know, when we're officially ending, then you can just kind of uh, creep out, but we do wanna get everything on the, on the, on the video. So, oh, are, are we ready? Oh, um, are, you, are you going to present yeah, the uh, final part? Hello, oh. hello. Hello, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. shall we the start? The floor or? is yours, okay, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So, hello everyone, I'm Wang Xiang from the US, and I'm going to present the final part about the fairness and uh, this is outline. So outline will be the, I will, I will be introducing the definition of the fairness and the inference of the unfairness and the uh, four major solutions for the unfairness issues. And uh, so the different from the, different from the previous part, when talking about the fairness, uh, we focus more on the biases on the user side. So let's recap the common paradigm of the training recommender model. So it's uh, just uh, giving us some data a user item and their interactions. We use the one representation learning module to generate user and item representations, and then phase those representations into an interaction module part to reconstruct the historical interactions. But besides the ID information, users are usually associated with some features uh, like age, gender, race, color, 
or regional or the uh, some marriage marriage information. So due to the existence of those features, user experience could be different. Uh, could be different. So in terms of the services effectiveness, like the results relevance of the user certification, and the, also in terms of the resulting com resulting outcomes. For example, when recommending jobs, that some users could expose to the lower paying job offers. And uh, also in terms of the, some uh, cost, for example, causing privacy uh, uh, linkage. So uh, one real world case is the price, uh, the different price. So when calling for a car or the taxi using like uh, Uber or the Grab, and uh, you and your friends are at the same point, a spot, at the same time, and they have the same pickup and the definitions. But the only difference is the your expert levels. So the price of the this this, this trade will be different. So this will cause the, this will cause the recommender models to give you and your uh, uh, kind of the discriminations. So hence the sensitive attributes are highly likely to cause unfairness and uh, further lead to the dis discrimination discrimination. So two common concepts are individual fairness and the group uh, level of fairness. The individual, the individual fairness encourages similar individu individuals to be treated similarly. Uh, similarly. And if such in, uh, fairness is a uh, uh, valid, individual discrimination might be caused. That is a model will give unfairly different uh, predication, uh, predictions to similar individuals. For example, uh, here is uh, there are two uh, football players. One is uh, from Africa and one is from Asia. Uh, eight. Uh, one is Africa and one is Asia. And uh, uh, the models uh, could be uh, could uh, predict wrongly, uh, predict them wrongly as the basket uh, basketball player and the ping pong player. Uh, so uh, due to their uh, race or and color, so that's definitely unfairness uh, things. And another concept is about the group fairness. Uh, it means a similar classifier uh, across uh, classify certi uh, uh, certifies across uh, groups. Uh, I mean the uh, module will treat different individuals who belong to the different groups unfairly. So the first question is the. Uh, uh, does the fairness issue exist in the recommendation system or in the recommendation scenarios? So uh, here I, I present two cases, and one is a prior uh, pri study done by uh, FAT World, and it in investigates whether group discrimination happens. That is the uh, the uh, here is about the demographic groups, about the age and the gender things. And uh, they treat the they, they tried some benchmarking models like item popularity, item pop, and the metric factorization FM, MF uh, on the two benchmark data sets. One is the last FM, uh, last FM, and one is the movie length one million data set. And uh, they find that uh, a result on the movie length one million and the last FM one K have the significant difference between the gender groups. And uh, the second funding is the result on the last FM, uh, the larger one has a significant, a significant difference between the edge uh, groups. And uh, another work is, uh, is, is another work studies about the uh, three user groups from last FM, and uh, which are based on how the uh, how the much you must uh, how much they are listening uh, preference divide from the most popular uh, music. So they divide the users into the three groups, with uh, low, uh, low, uh, medium, and high uh, mainstream users. And uh, just, uh, there are two, there are also the two uh, findings. The different users are treated differently, and the low mainstream user group significantly receives the worst recommendation. So uh, those two cases uh, proves or uh, shows that there is the uh, unfairness issues or the uh, discrimination issues in the recommendation system. Okay, let's move on to the second question is how to formulate or how to formalize the 
uh, uh, fairness or the discrimination in the mathematical language. So actually, there is a wide range of the dimensions thinking about the uh, considering the different concepts like the fair, uh, equal, uh, equal opportunity or the individual fairness or the demographic parity. So since our key point is the solution, and I will skip the detailed formulation here, and uh, I think we can discuss offline and uh, you can check it uh, via the Wikipedia or the other uh, previous works. So then the following question is uh, how to you how to issue, how to, uh, how to serve the uh, unfairness and how to issue the fairness in the recommender models. Uh, here, we, here we summarize the solution paradigms as the, uh, as the figure shows, these figures. Besides uh, this part, the, this part is our uh, standard uh, uh, pipeline of the recommender models. And besides the original pipeline that we plug and additional modules to fit the fairness criteria, which consists of two components. Uh, it's uh, the component, the first one is a sensitive attribute part. Uh, here is a, uh, denoted by the S. And uh, the second part is about the fairness definitions. Uh, this is a fairness criteria. And then the, uh, the current solutions can be roughly uh, grouped into the three categories based on the where the fairness modules place. And uh, the first uh, research line is about the re rebalancing and uh, uh, covering the pre-processing in the data modules, in the first module, in the data module, and uh, uh, in the, uh, the post-processing in the interaction modules, so just after training. And uh, the second research line is about the regularization part. And uh, this covering the in-processing in the representation learning and uh, this uh, last one is about the adversarial learning, uh, and it generates the fairness representation in the in this part. Uh, here I omit the uh, causal part, the causal inference or the causal uh, confounding part, uh, since the fully has uh, has introduced them. So here I cover, just cover the three uh, research line. Okay, I will uh, re introduce them one by one, one by one. So first, we zoom in the research line of the rebalancing. Uh, the idea is quite simple. It's just like the uh, cost E uh, introduced by Javi and Fuli. And uh, the key idea the, is uh, it has the two branch. The first branch is the we, uh, we plan, uh, we plug the uh, fairness criteria in the uh, pre-processing part. It's uh, to, we augment the data, it's uh, input the training data with some uh, this uh, respect, uh, respect some fairness metrics. And the second branch is uh, to place in the uh, po uh, post, play in the post processing, but just to balance the result with the fairness metrics. So the first example is the, uh, to, uh, on the pre processing, it uh, uses attitude data, it augments the input with the additional attitude data, and that can improve the social. Uh, desirability of the recommender. So uh, this this work is uh, this work is uh, uh, within some F MF family uh, as a backbone models, and uh, they found that uh, uh, when when we just using a small amount of the antidote data, and we can achieve the significant uh, improvements in terms of the uh, in terms of the fairness. So this is uh, similar to the cost E. And the second part is the, about the, the second branch is about the post processing is to do the fairness aware re-ranking. Uh, so this part is also similar to the re-ranking things uh, introduced by Javi and Fuli. And uh, sorry, this is a typical uh, part is the, we have the two scores. The first one is a personalized score determined by the base recommender. And the second one is about the personalized fairness as the importance of the group with attribute C. So here attribute C can be the sensitive, uh, sensitive attribute, age, gender, or the race, uh, race or color. Uh, and uh, so this part is uh, combines uh, these two terms within the trade-off uh, trade uh, uh, hyperparameter lambda. It's a combined uh, 
uh, personalized the induced term and the fairness induced term, and then promotes the uh, recommender results. So they evaluate they evaluate their uh, this idea on the several backbone models like the rank uh, rank SGD and the use, user KNN or the MF. So uh, they found that a balance between the two terms recommender accuracy remains uh, uh, at a high level after a re-ranking. So in the end, the recommender fairness is uh, significantly improved. So because there is a trade-off trade between the recommender accuracy and the recommender fairness. And the second line is about the regularization part. So different from the rebalancing scenes that play before and after uh, training, so the regularization term inject the fairness criteria in the model training. So they formulate, uh, speak, uh, to be speaking, uh, is, uh, they formulate the uh, uh, fairness criteria as a reg regularizer or regularization term to guide the optimization of the model. Uh, sorry for the typo, it's a model. Yeah. In the, the first, uh, in the uh, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, great work is a, uh, a general framework lens uh, fairness representation. It's uh, short for L LFR. So the the module uh, consists uh, the module consists of the three mo uh, components. The first part is the reconstruction loss. So this can be an uh, autoencoder just uh, to uh, give in some uh, input data x and then generate some some data, uh, some representation R. And the second part is the predictor, uh, uh, prediction error in the uh, generating prediction Y from the R. So this part is the in decoder part in the auto encode. So this is the encoder and this is a decoder. And the between them, and the, we use a regularization term to measure the dependency between the R and the sensitive attribute A. So that is, uh, uh, briefly put is the to uh, we uh, uh, predict uh, the synthetic predict uh, the uh, uh, user preference from the representation and uh, at the same time we predict the uh, uh, we predict the dependence uh, sensitive attributes from the representation. <clears throat> So uh, when the representation are fair, uh, so we mean uh, by fair, we mean uh, we encode the insensitive attribute uh, into the representation and then removes any, any information about the sensitive attributes out. So uh, some, two, some two, finding, uh, two findings, the first thing, when we're using the, uh, this uh, regularization term and we can push uh, discrimination to a very low values. And the will the when maintains a uh, uh, high accuracy, the pre uh, the recommendation uh, rec uh, uh, accuracy, and uh, this is a general uh, general framework, and uh, then we can apply it in the recommendation scenario or the other classification uh, scenario. And uh, so the the second part is uh, the second example is the new neutrality enhanced recommender. And it's the it's uh, using the regulation uh, regularization term, and it measures the negative mutual information between the sensitive attribute and the prediction y. So the also it uh, contains the three parts. The first part is the loss of the predicting uh, ratings. So this is uh, about the reconstruction loss as we, as uh, of all mentioned, and the second part is the, about the new relative functions and the neutrality functions, it's to quantify the degree of the information neutrality from a well point uh, variables. And uh, uh, it, uh, this independence is, uh, uh, can be formalized as a mutual, negative mutual information as a two methods, uh, how uh, the information amount uh, encodes uh, in the uh, prediction one. So it, uh, through this way and uh, the, the, this, this framework uh, can enhance the independence towards a specific uh, sensitive attribute. So the key idea is uh, to remove remove the sensitive, attri uh, sensitive attributes from the predictive and from the reputation. And the third example is the fairness aware the tens tension-based recommender. 
the short for FATR. The idea is the, to use the uh, sensitive, uh, they, they split the user reputation into the two parts. One part is the keeps the sensitive attributes, and the one part is the to keep the insensitive attributes. And then at the same time, they uh, encourage the uh, orthogonal constraint between the, those two kinds of the representations. And uh, through this, in, uh, within the orthogonal constraint, and it can uh, it can uh, el eliminate the sensitive information from the uh, from the uh, insensitive part, insensitive uh, uh, reputations, and uh, at the same time, maintains the recommendation qualities. And uh, this is uh, some trade off when comparing the those two, uh, uh, two branch. The, the first two branch as a re-ranking part or the rebalancing part. And uh, the middle part, the, sorry, the, this one is about the rebalancing and uh, this is a re-weighting and the middle uh, color, middle row is about the regularization part. Okay, uh, let's move on to the third uh, research line is about uh, fair representation learning. Uh, this is uh, using uh, different from the uh, regularization term is uh, uh, this part is uh, introduce another uh, modules that says the adversarial model the here H into the representation learnings and the key idea is the adversarial train as representation learning modules this part H and uh, based on the based on the uh, representations the predictions and uh, the adversarial modules can play the main max game. So I will introduce the minimax game later. And the first part is a uh, first example, general framework is uh, adversarial learning, uh, adversarial learned fair reputation, short for ARFR. And it constraint, it also uh, consistent of the three parts. The first part is the reconstruction loss. And uh, the second part is do the predictor of uh, error. And uh, the, the third part is the chain uh, adversarial models. The max main, guy, main game here is to uh, to do the encoder. So this is the encoder to minimize the reconstruction loss. To it it extracts the representations from the input data. So the representation R and the input data X. And uh, the green part is about the decoder. It the decodes the decodes the user preference from the representation. And the, the yellow part is uh, to train a uh, adversarial model and to encourage the independence between the representation R and the sensitive attributes. So rather than a regular, regularization term. So we play the main game, main game uh, in the red part and the green part. And then we play the max game uh, in the yellow part. So this is a main game. It's a very, uh, it's uh, just a copy of the uh, 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 adverse uh, training. So uh, it can encode the insensitive attributes and it removes the inf in sensitive information uh, from the representations. And uh, it can achieve the better performance and uh, fairness than the LFR, the regular regularization part, because uh, there is a, uh, we have the, a lot of uh, we, uh, because this, this model uh, is uh, more uh, flexible and the robust than the uh, regularization term. And the second example is uh, to do the compositional fairness constraints for the graph embedding. As, uh, because this ALFR is we only consider one type of the sensitive attribute, uh, like the age, uh, like the gender, and uh, in this in this uh, work, uh, the authors consider several uh, sensitive attributes at the same time, like the uh, gender uh, occupation or the age. Uh, age. Uh, this is uh, combined the uh, three uh, three parts, uh, three sensitive attributes into the same into a single module. So this part uh, this is a. Uh, uh, based on the ALFR, uh, the first uh, this work ALFR, and uh, the key difference is the focus on the graph structure data, because uh, in the recommendation uh, module or the social recommend social uh, uh, covering the collaborative filtering or the social recommendation of the knowledge graph 
uh, recommendation part, all the data can be organized as a, uh, as a graph. So they focus on the uh, graph structure data, and then uh, they use uh, uh, different from this part, uh, the just a train of single uh, uh, adversarial models, they train a, com a, co uh, they train a compositional uh, modules. They, com they combine the several uh, matrix on the several, uh, several sensitive attributes like gender, occupation, and age. And the last example is about the recommendation with the attributes protection. So this is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, apply. They apply ALFR the first work. This work on the group things on the uh, recommendation scenarios. So they treat a uh, base model BPR the vanilla MF as a predictor model, and then the, they treat uh, another adversarial modules and to pre uh, to protect the uh, private. Uh, privacy, user privacy, and uh, they named it as a, a attacker, uh, a attacker, yeah. And uh, they say RAP is a wrap, is the, their modules, and uh, as we can see, uh, they can generate, they can achieve the uh, better recommender performance, and uh, but the at the same time, it, they can uh, they can protect the users' uh, sensitive attributes from the linkage. So here I would like to summarize the, this part. So uh, representation learning, uh, fair representation learning can centralize the fairness constraint and the representation learning can simplify the task of the fairness audit. And the learned representation can be constructed to satisfy the multiple uh, fairness methods at the same time. And the learned representations can be simplified the task of the evaluating the fairness and the performance trade-off. But they have some disadvantage, uh, the less pre uh, pre precise control of the fairness and uh, the performance uh, trade-off because, uh, uh, because as we all know, the adversarial training or the adversarial learning uh, is, uh, is uh, unstable. It's uh, hard to, be, uh, to achieve the uh, it's hard to uh, to train the mean max gain uh, than the joint learning. So uh, that means we mm, uh, maybe there is a, uh, it is a difficult to train a, a, a to train a, a, sati a satisfy or the sati a sati satisfied a mean max gain to achieve the uh, fairness as the performance at the same time. And uh, the second disadvantage is uh, may lead to the fairness overconfidence. Because uh, for example, in the e-commerce uh, scenarios, uh, we all know the gender uh, may, be the, uh, may be the most inferenced fact, uh, inference, inferential factor to uh, decide, determine our uh, decision. So if we, uh, if we emphasize, overemphasize the uh, fairness on the uh, gender, and uh, we may uh, miss some, uh, we may uh, get the drop, the significant drop uh, in the prediction accuracy. So uh, uh, so this part is, uh, I think this is with, uh, we need to uh, care, uh, care about the fairness overconfidence. And uh, for the future uh, direction part, I think the um, causal, causal inference or the causal theory and uh, can be the uh, promising, uh, just uh, like the fully uh, introduced, and uh, we can use the, some uh, confounder uh, deconfounding method like the backdoor adjustment or the uh, front door adjustment uh, to uh, eliminate e e uh, to uh, reduce the inference of the uh, some confounders. Uh, for example, uh, we can treat the uh, user uh, sensitive attributes like the confounder between the user representations and the user preference. And then we, if we're using the deep confounding part, and uh, we can reduce the uh, uh, inference of the, this gender or the sensitive uh, attributes confounders. Okay, uh, that's all my part about the fairness. And uh, any question about this part?
So we have one question from the room. Yes, please. Hi there. Thank you for the, the nice presentation about these approaches to mitigating fairness uh, challenges and recommender systems. I was kind of wondering when it comes to situations where there is an asymmetric impact of um, model uh, effects, for instance, uh, recommendations on whether to uh, provide a loan to specific groups where it might be that a false yeah. positive is uh, preferable over a false negative. How would you incorporate such asymmetric effects in the losses or in the mitigation of fair, uh, fairness challenges? And did you see any work on this? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, so uh, uh, there is some noise. Uh, could you repeat your question again? Sorry for, for that. Sure, I'll, I'll try and be more succinct. So uh, sometimes the uh, loss impact would actually yeah. be different on a, for instance, a false uh, negative or a false positive in a very simple classification yeah. kind of scenario, right? How would you uh, deal with yeah, the fact yeah. that you want to uh, optimize stronger for avoiding false negatives than false positives? Oh, uh, I think so we, can we can formalize uh, this part, is the false positive or the false negative uh, in the part of the fairness criteria. So I think that this is uh, maybe the one solution, one possible solution. And so we consider the false positive and the false negative in the uh, fairness matrix, in the design of the fairness matrix. And then uh, we using the, uh, like the three, uh, three research lines, uh, rebalancing of the, of the uh, causal part of the fairness representations to encourage the uh, fairness uh, criteria towards the uh, false positive and the false negative. Uh, 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 so this is uh, my answer. Is, uh, is that okay for you? Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the great question. Yeah. So we have another question from uh, the room here. Uh, hi. Yeah. Thanks so much for the presentation. Yeah. I was taking notes uh, of all the papers you mentioned. It's a very good reading list. Uh, I wanted yeah. to ask, uh, since you've really. focused so much on the fairness aspect in this third part of the presentation, you focused a lot on sensitive attributes and how yeah. accuracy can be different. But the first part of the presentation was talking about all of these biases, such as exposure bias. Uh, is there any overlap in that first part of the presentation and here? Uh, uh, yeah. because some of these effects appear because of other biases in the data. So I'm curious how these things overlap and how you think about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, of course there is an overlap because uh, as I mentioned, the uh, fairness part is about the user side and uh, the exposure and the popularity bias is uh, more about the item side. But uh, in our, uh, in my opinion, um, I think this is all about the data, the data set bias. And if we uh, unify them in the, as the data, data set bias, and uh, we can uh, desi design some gen general framework. For example, uh, we treat all of them as the confounder between the representation part and the, uh, between the representation and between the user preference. Uh, for example, as I fully introduced, one of the, our, our work is to treat the popularity bias as the confounder between the item representation and the user preference. And, uh, in, and uh, as I introduced uh, before, is uh, when the work uh, about the fairness, they treat, uh, they can treat the, uh, we can treat the uh, fairness as a confounder between the user representation and the user preference. So there is an overlap in the uh, framework idea, in the uh, basic idea. Uh, so uh, my my answer uh, is that, that of course there is a overlap, and then we can use a causal inference part of the causal idea to unify them into a one uh, frame, one uh, one uh, framework of the pipeline to serve the data set bias. Okay, uh, that's my answer. So is that okay or, or yeah, is that clear? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very yes, much. Uh, may, maybe just a, a logistics question, uh, because oh. on the on the schedule you were planning to talk for fifty minutes. Do you have do you have more slides, or did you compress your slides? 
Oh no no no! I think so. We range. Uh, we just uh, split, split the uh, data set equally. So I think the time time is up. Yeah yeah. We can take we can yeah, take yeah. maybe one more question. Is there another another question for the for the tutorial presenters? Um, so okay, maybe one more question here. Um, so when you're talking about fairness, is it always necessary to define the fairness or the, the categories in advance? So like your protect your protected attributes, uh, do, do you need to know them in advance in order to be able yeah. to apply? Mm -hmm. And and as as we move forward, do you see? Uh, any interesting developments in the area where we might not know in advance what the relevant uh, attributes are that we want to protect? Uh, okay, so in the most cases, I think we need to predefine or the pre um, identify the fairness. So about some sensitive attributes, we, pre we need to predefine and the, we need to uh, identify the localize the uh, where the unfairness come 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 from, uh, but I since I uh, I have seen some work about the NLP, and uh, they they do not uh, 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 they do not localize the one specific uh, data bias. They treat all the data bias like the long tail uh, distribution of the words. Yeah, all the uh, they uh, describe the data bias like the, like the long tail uh, phenomenon, uh, the distribution of the words or the tokens. And I think in our uh, domains, in recommendation domains, uh, maybe sometimes or maybe in the short future, and uh, we can treat them as the uh, one of the long term or the long tail uh, distribution of the like the users or the. Uh, items in terms of some materials uh, of the matrix. Yeah, I think, uh, and then uh, after we, uh, we uh, construct all the, uh, construct such long tail distribution, and uh, this will be, uh, and we can capture the, uh, the head part as a shortcut. And then the shortcut learning will uh, in introduce, will lead to the unfairness because the shortcut part and the uh, shortcut may, uh, should be the head part, and uh, the fairness, unfairness will will be raised on the uh, tail part, and then our 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 goal or the, our task we will convert to the how to we uh, how to we reduce the shortcuts in the recommendation part. Okay, uh, that's my question. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's my answers about yes. the question. Okay, thank Sorry. you very <laughs> much. Okay, oh, we have okay. one more question coming from, let's take that, oh. Oh, but, but only one this time, right? Yeah, one. <laughs> one, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question okay, is thanks. related or a continuation to Marta's question and related to the RI, uh, R, RAP paper, Privacy Aware Recommendation. So that paper, they try to protect against uh, the, to protect sensitive attributes, age, gender, occupation, and yeah. to maintain recommendation. So the following, yeah. they did not treat fairness. Would you think that paper can also have a fairness recommendation? So they protected the age, gender, and occup occupation. Would you think that we will get fair recommendation with respect to male and female, different age uh, interval, and different occupation? Uh, uh, yes, I think so. I think they can <laughs> because it's, it's, it's not my work. So, uh, so uh, I think in their formulation and from the, the, uh, the, uh, this paper, and I think I can safely conclude and uh, they can recommend uh, fairly across the uh, different groups. Like the gender group and the occupation group and the edge group, yeah, I think they can do that. And uh, uh, then uh, we can uh, we can use in the uh, comp uh, combinational fairness matrix, and then to uh, ensure them uh, at ensure the uh, recommendation result fair be fair uh, across the combination of the sensitive sensitive uh, groups. 
Okay, uh, yeah. uh, that's my answer. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. So let's have okay. one final round of applause for all the presenters of this tutorial. <laughs> Thanks, really, thanks. really thanks appreciate for listening, it. Listening. Please, yeah. Thanks. Great. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. So we'll see everybody in the room uh, at at lunch then.